Act okay. Um, so uh, this is our first session on a, on a, a new book by a new author, um, uh, Platonic Productions, uh, Stanley Rosen. It's kind of continuations of some of the themes uh, of our last thing on um, uh, Heidegger, because toward the end of the last book on Heidegger reading, um, the issue of um, Heidegger versus Plato on notions <clears throat> of the proper atmosphere, uh, uh, horizon on which being is understood kind of came up and the uh, Heidegger on Plato's allegory of the cave came up. Um, so we're kind of steering towards some of those topics. Um, but this is also kind of a, a, a break from straight Heidegger. But this is Rosen talking specifically about um, ideas in Plato that are prompted by uh, Heidegger's reading of Plato. That's really the way to think about this. This was um, Rosen's last book. Rosen is a um, uh, longstanding American professor of philosophy. I think he died like four years ago, five years ago, something like that. Um, and this was his last published book in 2014. Um, and his third book on Heidegger. Um, he's got lots of books on other things. Uh, he's mostly known as a Plato scholar. He's like a lot of people, including Heidegger himself, uh, tended to teach widely in the whole history of philosophy. Um, so he had, you know, lots of books on uh, uh, Plato and Hegel and, uh, you know, various moderns and so forth. Um, but uh, it's kind of three books in his history on uh, on Heidegger, an early one about Nietzsche and Heidegger called Nihilism, a middle one called uh, The Question of Being Reversal of Heidegger, which is sort of a when he realized that the lumping Heidegger together with Nietzsche was too shallow and he had to sort of take him on on his own. Um, and this one is sort of a, a later one when he realized he hadn't quite given full fair shakes to him. And I think it's fair to say that Rosen was still coming to grips with Heidegger over his life and learning more from him and be more indebted to him for learning things about Plato that he hadn't understood before and so on. But um, by temperament and background, he's a Platonist. That's the thing to understand. Um, so he's a Platonist who's grappling with um, what Heidegger says about Platonism. That's kind of the general topic here. So Platonic production, the production of the title um, is referring to the uh, one of the theses of uh, ascribed to Heidegger that um, he understands uh, Greek metaphysics uh, as Platonism, as uh, issuing in the uh, notion of being as production or to be is to be produced, something like that. Um, there's a separate uh, understanding of being as parousia, uh, which is also a, a, um, enduring presence uh, that you also get. Um, but, uh, and both those are discussed here, but the, the production of the title is referring to this uh, question is, is there, uh, to, what, to what degree is being and being produced equatable in Plato? That's sort of the, what he's imagining is the charge that, uh, charge, uh, that uh, uh, Heidegger has uh, leveled against uh, Platonism, something like that. And so Rosen's question as a Plato scholar is, is this true about um, Plato's understanding of being um, and particularly about the ideas? So this issues and questions of um, uh, are ideas discovered or created? Um, is truth uh, a matter of discovery or invention? Um, is this uh, understanding of um, uh, truth as techne or something like that um, uh, that we get in later Heidegger something which is there at the uh, at the beginning in Plato or does it come in later along the way? Um, so uh, that's, that's sort of a general theme in Heidegger's understanding of sort of the history of metaphysics uh, in the West. Um, and Rosen is um, interested in seeing whether or not the diagnosis of it is true at the origin point in Plato. So that's sort of the general problematic of why, what the book is about at all. Um, now there's lots of things he's gonna take up along the way, uh, including places where Heidegger directly engages with um, uh, Plato in these questions. Um, but he's also interested in this for it's um, sort of contemporary philosophical relevance. The other schools of philosophy these days, what they teach on the same kinds of questions, um, is Heidegger illuminating about them? Um, he's thinking in particular of uh, Anglo-Saxon philosophy um, uh, and, and the analytic tradition, um, which tends to be more in this uh, um, technical uh, uh, direction. He's thinking of uh, doctrines like um, that uh, truth is a attribute of a proposition, Truth is in propositions, not in things, those sorts of questions. Okay, 
and just background on what the book uh, is even about and, 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 and kind of why we're doing it. Um, usual thing we do is go around the table and get people's first reactions to things. Um, you know, did you manage to do the reading? Uh, did you manage to get the book and do the reading? Um, any prior experience with either Rosen, uh, these topics in uh, Plato or some of the Heider problematic here uh, before, um, and that can be ne negative too, if this is new to you. Um, and then just any first impressions on the reading. Our reading, by the way, was the first three chapters. This is the first half. We're gonna do this over two sessions. Um, uh, and then move on to something else. But uh, all right, that's that's enough for intro from me. Um, so we wanna just go around the table and get first uh, first impressions. Carlos? Uh, yes, I did do the reading and actually I've read it twice because it takes me a while to <laughs> digest and uh, these things. But I, I got, uh, I wouldn't say sidetracked, but I got, I got particularly interested in, uh, I don't know if, if I misunderstood it, but this apparently Western philosophy, Western tradition is heavily uh, dependent on the Aristotelian uh, product. And for example, something you said earlier that I've always held um, inviolable is that truth belongs to the statement. Mm -hmm. And this whole reading has led me to believe that maybe that's not the case, or there may be alternate uh, um, interpretations. Yeah, well, you but definitely, again, this, you definitely get that. Sorry, just a quick interruption. You definitely get that directly. I mean, Aristotle says that directly, right? And 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 uh, Heidegger quotes Aristotle saying that directly, and uh, he also talks about it at the beginning of this uh, this as something which is sort of almost taken as a matter of course in in more modern philosophy, um, but that. Uh, Heidegger is saying that that's a change. It's, that wasn't the original Greek understanding of what uh, truth was about. Um, and so he's interested in locating where that change occurs. Um, and, uh, but, and he sort of uh, puts it at uh, start, starting with Plato. And um, Rosen is sort of, did it really start with Plato or did it start with Aristotle? Um, that's mm -hmm. one of the top, top of chapter one. But um, this notion of is, is truth something which, uh, occurs when human beings understand something? Um, is truth something which is a property of things? Or is truth only a property of uh, thoughts or statements about things or of, of assertion? And the person who characteristically locates truth in the assertion is uh, Aristotle in his, uh, especially in his logical works, but also in his metaphysics. Sorry, go ahead. And the other, the other aspect, there are many aspects, the ones that come to mind right now are, is this idea of, uh, reminds me, I think it was, it was Wittgenstein who said that you can't have thought without language. And I've always thought that was kind of weird, but again, I'm not a philosopher. Uh, and then there is this item related to all of that, that uh, predication uh, is how we structure ideas and concepts and so on. And there's this other concept of what is it, eidetic intuition? Which is no, well, noet, noetic intuition is the main thing we talk about here. Noetic also, intuition. There is also eidetic intuition in in Husserl and to some degree in Plato, but the the one he talks about for most chapter one is noetic intuition, meaning With, no noesis is m m mind or the noetic realm or uh, the men purely mental, um, which would bypass like, language, right? Could yes. Could okay. So uh, anyway, so th those are all. It's a it's a a few items of the ones that I noted, and there are a bunch of others I didn't write down, but very interesting. And I, again, I read it twice to see if I get more out of it, but you know, it was enough. Wait, looking forward to the discussion to see if it elucidates further what I was. Like, yeah, those are, those, are, those are all you know, uh, definite topics um, coming up in, in, in chapter one itself um, from the whole problematic of, you know, is, is truth about uh, propositions, is truth about language, um, uh, wrote Rosen kind of kind of agrees with Heidegger that he's onto something when he diagnoses the history of metaphysics as it's gone from substance to syntax, right? Yeah, the, subject, the, the, the subject matter of metaphysics uh, started off being about what is the nature of substance? And uh, uh, these days it's, you know, what's the right syntax of logical propositions? Um, and they're thinking about many of the same kinds of things, but the, the subject matter has gone so linguistic on us um, uh, anyway, and so Rosen is agreeing that that tendency that or that direction is there. And the question is just um, uh, what's behind that tendency and direction. Joe? 
coming off here. I always have to, I always have to find the unmute button. Uh, this idea of noetic, I had to look that up and I got the idea that it's, it's like direct recognition of something. It's a very direct, you know, you, you see it, you know it, that kind of thing. Am I wrong? <laughs> Not completely wrong. I mean, uh, it, I mean, it initially refers to um, noetic realm, or the it refers to the mind. It's a Greek word for uh, for, for mind. Um, yes. But but it's it's being yes, but it's it's being you it's used in as a term of art, kind of in uh, first in Plato to dis, uh, to distinguish the realm where things are true from the realm where things are perceived. You find this in the Republic and the Divided Line. The whole realm of the perceptibles is over here, and the whole noetic realm is over there. Um, Mathematical and logical truth is part of the noetic as opposed to the, uh, or mental like as opposed to the perceptible or the physical, roughly. Um, and then what you get in uh, Aristotle is a notion of noetic intuition. Um, so it's not just noetic, noetic is not being used as an adjective, but the thing that it's adjectiving is intuition. And uh, this is also related to Aristotle's doctrine of the common sense. Um, and common sense doesn't mean common sense, man on the street, common sense it means something more like uh, the Kantian um, uh, unity of apperception. It's the it's the, the common faculty that judges that all of the different senses are talking are referring to the same object. So the 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 mental judgment that puts together your perceptions for your just different senses as being about one single thing is a noetic intuition that all those things are properties of that one thing. So mm -hmm. the claim in Aristotle is that noetic intuition is what provides us with the unity of the, or the, of the synalon of the individual subject. And that kind of corresponds to what you get later in Kant with the idea of the transcendental unity of apperception. But anyway, Noetic intuition like this is this idea that there's some faculty which is putting together the sense information, but is not a piece of sense information itself. Right. Is its most technical use in, in Aristotle. And then people afterwards debate, you know, can we understand noetic intuition? Do we actually have a faculty of noetic intuition? Is this noetic intuition something uh, made up and tacked on because we can't uh, uh, find it? Um, and Rose, Rosen uh, um, talks in, in Later in chapter one, about how there's a there's a tendency later in the tradition to want to jettison, dispense with the idea of noetic intuition because it's the part of the description of things that doesn't have words attached to it, right? All the other things about predication, you can find parts of the description of the formula in words. There's different um, um, categories predicated of something, and you know it has a number and it has a uh, you know, uh, a mode or whatever. You can you can find uh, different ways of analyzing something, but the noetic intuition part isn't in the words. It's like a silently done additional act. And so Rosen is seeing that there's a tendency in the tradition to want to get rid of that because it, it looks like an extraneous extra you don't need, and it looks mysterious, and it looks like it doesn't have a, a linguistic description. So when you want to have the things be reducible to the linguistic description, you try to get rid of that piece. But from Aristotle's point of view, that piece is essential to anchoring all of our talk about something in the thing we're talking about. That is what we call the name something. And, and I'm referring now to Kripke's recent claim, and I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, uh, <laughs> there, there, are, there are definitely people, uh, later people who will try to um, uh, have this same sort of uh, um, yeah, I mean, th there's modern no notions of naming about it. There's uh, Husserlian notions about uh, uh, intentionality about it that are about the same kind of anchoring uh, the perceptions or the thoughts and the things being uh, thought or talked about. Um, but those are, um, in a way, they're uh, substitutes for the noetic intuition idea that you get in uh, Aristotle, who's trying to be way more commonsensical about it. In, in Plato, it's got much more of this notion of it's a place where you have um, a less perceptible realm of uh, uh, purer truth, something like that. Um, um, the noetic is uh, more purely thought-like 
than the material perceptible, which is more affected by the categories of time and change or something like this. This, this is you know, what you see in the idea that the truths of mathematics are uh, independent of time, right? They're noetic truths to Plato. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, so yes, noetic is a, uh, a definite term of art being used here in the first, uh, first uh, uh, chapter. And it, there's a lots of changes being rung upon it. Um, but the, 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 the kind of Rosen's point in the chapter is that um, there was still a robust notion of noetic intuition in Aristotle and sorry, I mean, in, searched originally in Plato and then still in Aristotle. And Aristotle is not responsible for getting rid of that and replacing it with just a notion of predication only as being the only source of truth about uh, things because he still had a noetic intuition that anchored the things that we're saying about things in the thing we're saying about, right? But people after uh, Aristotle tend to want to get rid of that. Um, he, he, he says, we go through three stages. We find that the, uh, the noetic intuition is superfluous. And then the, the, the essential property is um, uh, uh, first invisible, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, second unknowable, and then third non-existent, right? So, uh, and as soon as you've gotten rid of noetic intuition and the central properties, all you're left with is, is the subject and accidental properties. And that's sort of how you wind up spiraling towards nominalism farther and farther away from the origin point from Rose, Rose's point of view. You can see some of that development in the uh, Islamic medievals or people like William of Ockham um, who are moving towards the idea that you just have ways of talking about names which are you know subjects with ac accidental properties right so that's sort of the the other extreme you could go towards versus having a fully structured thing that you have noetic intuition access to to you just have words talking about accidental conglomerations of associations in your head right this was a more disordered version does that help Thank you very much for digressing in my behalf. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have uh, that, that clarifies some things. I know I now have other questions to ask my other philosophers. Let's go discuss them for you. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, uh, uh, Austin. Oh, uh, so I um, I finished this. Um, I, I finished reading it uh, once. It was kind of a flurry. Um, <laughs> so I, I have a, kind of a, like an impression of the book. Um, yes. I, w I was kind of wondering about the um, how strong of a distinction he wants to make between Plato and Aristotle, because it does seem like in the subsequent tradition of the history of Western metaphysics, they're, they're treated like much, much like they're the same, right? Um, and so what Heidegger seems to be picking up on in the deconstruction of the history of Western metaphysics doesn't seem to be um, so concerned with uh, some originary point in Plato that could have been because that point was like long betrayed. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I guess I wonder, I, I'm just wondering um, about like the ground for, for, how, for how Rosen is, is thinking about returning yeah. to Plato. Yeah, well, so because uh, uh, Rosen is a Platonist and not an Aristotelian, right? He sees sharp distinctions there where other people might see just a, you know, oh, that's what the Greeks thought a long time ago and, and put them, lumped them together. But he sees sharp distinctions between them. And he spends much of chapter one saying that the, the metaphysics that uh, Heidegger diagnoses as being Platonism is better called Aristotelianism, right? Because it, to the extent that what he's talking about is production as met metaphysics, it's just this uh, move towards truth being in the proposition and uh, not in the things and a purely linguistic analysis of concepts and the doctrine of being qua being that you get in uh, Aristotle's metaphysics. All of that is not Plato, all of that is Aristotle. And uh, Aristotle came up with, with, with much of it, violently disagreeing with Plato. Um, and uh, so uh, from Rosen's point of view, this doesn't issue in the same metaphysics as what you had in, in Plato. We saw some of this when we did the, the Gilson book, Being in Some Philosophers, about the sharp distinction between those two notions of especially essence and um, substance. Um, the, the essence notion that you get in the Platonic tradition, which continues, um, it doesn't simply uh, get subsumed, right? There's a whole Platonic tradition that descends from Plato directly bypassing Aristotle and not agreeing with him on some of those points. Um, uh, 
tends to treat being as essence and not as uh, it, when, when Aristotle tries to move to the thing which really is, is the, uh, is the particular. Um, uh, and then we only have the, the, the essences are just, you know, um, uh, general concepts and abstractions about them. That's sort of the, the typical um, Aristotelian move on Platonism, but the Platonists don't agree with it at all. And if, especially if you're talking about something like the doctrine of the ideas to a Platonist, they, for them, that's the point in which they most sharply distinguish themselves from the Aristotelians. So um, don't tell me that, that the, uh, this, this uh, metaphysics of, pred uh, of predication is the same thing as the ideas when it was invented to disagree with the ideas, is sort of the attitude of that first chapter. Um, now, uh, you can, plenty of other people may think that just because they, they think that Aristotle was right on that point, they're only interested in following that Aristotelian branch, so to speak. Um, there's other people who will think that they've got, um, um, certainly by the time you get someone like Nietzsche, right, he'll be perfectly willing to see um, things he thinks are going on in the, in Plato and Aristotle, you know, against the intentions of Plato and Aristotle. It's like what they were really doing was X. And, you know, the fact that they claimed that they were doing Y doesn't mean they were doing Y because, um, you know, if you're a uh, Nietzschean, you're allowed to say that uh, philosophers are involuntary, have involuntary confessions in their philosophies. and. Uh, uh, so if if uh, if Plato gives you a doctrine that says no human being could do this, this was the, only the gods do this, um, uh, a Nietzsche is perfectly willing to say you're just not willing to sign your bills. Of course you're the one who did it, right? Um, and it's it's his cynicism saying that you did it and it's only ascribed it to God. But uh, uh, um, a Nietzsche is perfectly willing to make that uh, that assignment. So the point is that how much you take a person's own word what the meaning or historical influence, whatever their position is, is moving across these people. They're not all taking someone's original word for uh, what their doctrine is and what it purely means. But someone like Rosen, because he's a Platonist, is definitely got a dog in that fight. He wants to distinguish Plato from things after him. And if someone's coming along and saying, this is a result of Platonism, he's gonna think, hold on a second, that's not Platonism. Platonism is this thing that I think, not this other thing that the people I've been disagreeing with forever think. That help? Yeah, I think so. Like he, he wants to continue a line of Platonic productions. Um, uh, he wants them to not simply be productions, but uh, uh, he's got his own uh, criticisms of the notion that uh, Platonic uh, metaphysics is best understood as a production as opposed to discovery. Um, but he, he basically, uh, he's gonna give some, he's gonna, uh, um, make some concessions to the truth of uh, Heidegger's point and all that. But the, in the first chapter, for example, he's gonna be um, saying that um, much of what uh, Heidegger sees in the history of Western metaphysics is descended from Aristotle and not from Plato. And then by chapter three, he's gonna be saying much of the criticisms that Heidegger makes of the supposed failings of Platonic metaphysics directly are just untrue. Um, those, fa those alleged failings simply are not in Plato and exactly the opposite things that uh, uh, Heidegger is, is extolling are in Plato. Um, so that is, uh, Heidegger is failing to prove even that Plato disagrees with him <laughs> on some of these points. Um, that's where he's gonna be by chapter three. Um, but anyway, that, so it, it's, these are, these are good, good topics to raise, but the reason that there is a, a terrain on which, uh, which to fight about it is because if someone has a particular agreement in all this, they're very um, sensitive to uh, whether or not people have are, are ascribing ascribing to a whole tradition a position that they agree with or that they disagreed with because they 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 staked out agreement with this and disagreement with that for reasons and all those reasons matter to them and they want to pay attention to. Quick question. Sure. You mentioned something about a, a uh, branch of the Platonic tradition bypassing Aristotle. What are you sure. referring? What is that Neoplatonism? Well, yes, I'm, I'm thinking of things like Neoplatonism. And there's a lot of uh, uh, later ex examples of that that go into the uh, some of the church fathers that are descended more from the Platonists and the Aristotelians mm -hmm. and so on. Um, uh, and but the Neoplatonic tradition certainly. Uh, when we when we did the Gilson book, right? There was a whole line of those guys, right? That uh, um, that, that, I mean, this is going to include people like Plotinus and include peop, um, uh, people like, um, what am I thinking of? Um, uh, uh, 
Dionysus the Areopagite, it would include people like um, uh, Augustine, right? Uh, so th there's a there's a whole uh, okay. more, more Platonic tradition there that is not simply you know agreeing with any of Plato's criticisms of um, sorry John Philoponus be another one uh, that are not simply agreeing with uh, Aristotle's criticisms of Plato. Um, and it, it really is a kind of a change when Aristotle comes back in in a big way in the, in the medievals, uh, having come through the uh, Islamic Aristotelians and coming back in with Thomas Aquinas and so forth, that mm -hmm. Aristotle kind of makes a big splash again in the, in the, in the high middle ages when he's been um, not that important for uh, a, a, an intervening, you know, 1500 years. years, yeah, 1400 mm -hmm. years, something like that. Um, yeah, fair question. Pete. Uh, so I had actually read uh, Rosen's The Question of Being yep. about 15 years ago and forgotten a lot of it. Uh, so the, and of course now I'm reading it in a lot more detail, uh, more, more aware of uh, what the arguments are. Uh, I was kind, kind of Surprise! I guess I don't read a lot of Platonists, but to hear people defending the theory of forms, uh, I, I, I was surprised the uh, uh, a robust defense of the theory of uh, forms, and uh, you know I just kind of uh, absorbed it. Uh, I, I have some uh, pushback in certain places where I think Rosen's misunderstanding uh, what Heidegger's saying. Uh, I also get the impression reading it that there's Plato and there's Heidegger and they're uh, debating, you know, is Heidegger suddenly come up with this bad interpretation of Plato? But when I start looking in a few places of what did Heidegger actually say? He might be quoting Descartes, who's quoting Aquinas, who got something from Averroes' commentaries on Aristotle. And so Plato might have said this, and Heidegger saying this, but Heidegger's that particular thing, Heidegger didn't make that up, that criticism of Plato. He's just going along, like you said, since uh, the later Middle Ages, Renaissance, uh, Plato became, I'm sorry, Aristotle became the philosopher for Christianity, just like he'd been for Islam. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know enough about this, but also potentially medieval uh, uh, Jewish thought. And that I read something else this week that said that the source of the correspondence theory of truth becoming dominant uh, was this person traced it to a Jewish philosopher around 1000 AD. Um, so, you know, I, I basically just picked up, you know, R Rosen's criticisms, and uh, I, I can see where, where he, he's a defender of the theory of forms, and yeah, uh, if, if I was in the same position, I, I would have similar criticisms uh, of, of Heidegger. Heidegger is not a Plato scholar. Uh, he didn't spend a lot of time uh, on Plato, although he did uh, do the uh, allegory of the cave at several points in different years. Uh, well, there's also, it's fair, but he also did has, you know, there's the whole uh, Essence of Truth book and then the whole Sophist book, so. Right, and part of it is uh, how, how did this stuff come out? So we sort of have the public Heidegger that was the stuff that was published up until his death. And there, the main one is an essay he wrote in 1940 
on uh, Plato's Doctrine of Truth. Yep. That's in Pathmarks. And that's kind of like the prosecution's case for Plato creating met uh, metaphysics and it's all his fault. Uh, <laughs> and then after that, we got his, uh, after Heidegger died, we got his lectures and specifically the 19 early 30s ones uh, on the essence of truth, the Plato allegory. And so we see the, you know, Heidegger actually had a more sympathetic, more uh, well, new yeah. un reading of Plato than in his main work, blaming Plato for metaphysics. And I, I was kind of, one of the areas I was reading more closely was how do we get from truth as discovery to truth as corresponding with the facts. And I'm actually not seeing it in Plato. Uh, it is there in Aristotle. And so that, that's what I'm trying to do more research on and see who actually, where does that transition uh, actually happen? Because Heidegger is right that Plato has a new understanding of truth that's different from the pre-Socratics. But it's hard to see that Plato's responsible for truth becoming the correspondence of truth to facts or assertions to facts. And so I'm sure we'll go into more detail in some of these things I mentioned. Absolutely. That's my impression. No, it's all, it's all fair impression. And uh, it's useful to sort of know some of the um, publication history of these things too. I think it's fair to say that um, uh, there's multiple versions of what it means to be, uh, how to, there, to, what it means for there to be a platonic foundation of metaphysics. Um, one is the correspondence theory of truth or this um, uh, uh, truth is in propositions proposition. Um, uh, related to that is the degree to which um, uh, truth becomes a matter of speech about things um, truth becomes a matter of uh, um, discourse. Um, truth becomes a matter of predication, right? Uh, those are all those are all related, and it seems to me pretty clear that Aristotle is the main originator of that side of things. But there's at, le at least two other possible ways in which Plato could be an origin of metaphysics. One is this um, enduring presence uh, uh, notion of being, and another is the one which. Um, is a more direct understanding of what it means for being to be, be produced that doesn't go through the correspondence theory. It just goes through this um, uh, produced as arranged um, uh, Herstel idea, the idea that you, that you are forming things, that the forming of things is the, is the creation of their being. Um, and that idea is closer to what you actually do still, uh, do already have in Plato. Right? It's a place where Plato and Aristotle are actually in closer agreement. Even that one is clear in, in Aristotle, but, it's, but it's, there's some elements of it already there in Plato. So um, I think it's an open question to what degree different aspects of what Heidegger is identifying as the later metaphysical tradition are platonic in origin and to what degree they're, uh, uh, they're later. Some of the things which he regards as like the the, 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 the most thoroughgoing, uh, consistent versions of the techne understanding of truth may be as late as Nietzsche, um, but others may already be there in, uh, are already in, in people like Philo or people like uh, Aristotle. Um, in terms of Rosen, um, uh, I don't think he always makes his case. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely, in, the, in, in assessment of the chapter, uh, go through this. I think it's fair to say that chapter two is full of statements against interest to speak legalese, right? Um, where you know he's got his brief, but he makes the other guy's case involuntarily, um, uh, and we'll definitely want to talk about that. I think he's got a stronger case in one that you know uh, Aristotle's fingerprints are on the body, um, and uh, and in in three that um, some of the uh, some of the mm -hmm. other common allegations against Plato aren't true, and that's also coming out in some of uh, um, 
uh, Heidegger's own more sympathetic readings of, uh, of Plato in the allegory of the case you talked about. Um, but in chapter two, where he's talking about whether or not there are ideas of artifacts, um, I don't think he fully makes his case. Um, and we'll, we'll definitely get to that when we get to the uh, reactions to things. But it's fair to be critical of how much uh, uh, Rosen manages to prove his case here. Um, I also think it's fair to say that this book is taking Heidegger more seriously on some of these things than the earlier uh, uh, question of being reversal of Heidegger book you talk about, where I think he yeah. thought he could deal with him in a more flip manner um, uh, with the, the typical tools he used to dispatch lesser lights uh, uh, that he had dealt with uh, along the way. Um, but uh, so, and I think part of that's that Rosen was still struggling with these issues with um, Heidegger to the end of his life. Um, it was a, a live thing for when he was still learning from him. But uh, all, all, all good points. Um, Dan, first impressions. So let's see. I read the book, or I'm in chapter five now, so hopefully I'll finish it by the end of today. Um, I'm also, I'm, uh, so for two weeks now, I'm reading Plat Plato Sophist, so the Heidegger's course. And yep. The one thing is like, it strike it struck me there is like I'm one third into that book and Heidegger is still talking about Aristotle. He's not talking about Plato. <laughs> so it's, it's there, like I, I, I saw that when, yeah. That's yeah, that's the one that I'm reading. Yeah. So it's, yeah, he's, um, I, I see that point that instead of starting with Plato, he starts with Aristotle and said, well, that's, we start from the clear one and the, the simple one and the more radical one and go backwards, but, it's kind of fishy, but I, yeah. So uh, let's see. So, you know what, one thing that struck me, like I was kind of, it's, it's strange to me, like I read some uh, Plato, I read some Aristotle and uh, reading them in translation, it's like, it's either trivial or it's, or it's not, not clear at all. So it seems like to, to settle this dispute, one needs to go back to, 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 to Greek as you started. So, so we, we either take, I don't know, Heidegger's word or take, or take uh, Rosen's word for these things. It's, it's very difficult to, to make our own judgments or at least by going back to the source. But I see the points. I, I think it's good that someone is taking, like uh, is criticizing Heidegger and it's showing some cracks there in the system. But I think that in general, it's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm staying with Heidegger. <laughs> okay, fair enough. We haven't gotten through the whole thing, but fair enough. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Craig? Well, I did the reading, and I'd have to say I basically got lost. Okay. Um, I feel better now. Yeah, it was, it was uh, challenging to keep track of, of who's crashing who, at what point, and, uh, and where they were going. So... So I was struggling with it. I also read the uh, the Nietzsche section that uh, that Pete brought up. That was a little easier to understand. Um, I guess the the struggle I have is still trying to get at this whole sense of objects, uh, like beds, and and things. Uh, in a in a modern day when uh, when we're so far so far beyond that kind of technology. Um, so I was I was struggling to make make kind of a sense of it. <coughs> So I'm going to be probably pretty much listening at this point, trying to trying to understand uh, the importance of this stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, uh, certainly in in chapter two, the bed chapter, so to speak, uh, uh, Rosen is not at his strongest. I could have come up with better examples, uh, uh, but I, the reason he's talking about it is because there's a, um, a whole thematic discussion of this in in, in uh, book ten of the Republic that that they're all. Heidegger is referring to, and therefore Rosen is referring to, right? Um, uh, but uh, when it when it comes to just trying to understand why there are um, people, not just Rosen, in the modern world who take Platonism seriously, um, it may help to start by asking yourself questions like, uh, "Where is Schrodinger's wave equation, and did Schrodinger <laughs> invent it?" Um, because uh, that's yeah. that's the kind of ex, that's the kind of uh, existence claim that Plato is really thinking about when he's thinking about something like a noetic realm. Um, uh, there are things like that where if you're just talking about coming up with like uh, 
some uh, complicated curve that makes a picture that vaguely looks like a person riding a bicycle, you can tell they're constructed, right? Even though it's a mathematical formula. But if you're talking about something that simple that explains that much, it's more like it's discovered. It seems to it seems to be like it was even if it was only discovered recently, it's always been there. It's always been true. The thing that it's true about is, has always been true, and that sense of the discovered, not made nature of some um, pure pure mathematical truth realm is what is attractive about Platonism to inform people, um, and they're not primarily thinking about beds, honestly. Um, uh, so anyway, that's just a, 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 basic, a basic outline point. Um, uh, when mathematicians and physicists would debate with one another about these things, the mathematicians tend to be on the Platonist side of things of um, they don't think that they're making it. They think they're discovering it. Sometimes they will say that they think that uh, uh, they're, they're just uh, playing linguistic games with formal rules, but they don't actually believe that when they're actually doing the work. Right? It's not how they actually discover things. Um, they're only saying that because they don't have any compact, coherent philosophy to explain the experience of uh, investigating truth they actually have, which is much closer to the Platonist one. Um, anyway, that's just a just to get uh, a little bit more real than the than the beds examples, because I realize those can get lost in terms of the other things that are difficult and challenging. And, and Rosen, he has this. Um, uh, I'd say uh, academic and debater's vice of the, the machine gun brief, right? He's going to give you every point he has come up with over 20 years of thinking about the problem in, you know, one paragraph, did you get my witty point? Next paragraph, you know, and they not, might not be all that coherently linked to one another. Um, uh, there are places where he's sustaining more than that. Um, but certainly in the, chap in the first chapter, he's doing a lot of that. And he's also not just arguing against Heidegger. He's often using points that Heidegger makes to argue against other people he wants to argue with, with like Klein or something, right? So he'll be trying to make some point about um, modern analytical philosophy. And then two paragraphs later, he's you know making a point against Heidegger instead. He didn't tell you that he switched, right? He just, he's just expecting you to pick up all the changes because you know who all the different players are, are, are in the room and the various people he has brickbats for. And <laughs> um, you know, so there's a lot of, assumption and inside baseball and, and just the way he talked about those things. And that's just the way Rosen is. I mean, it's not uh, all professors. He's just, he's that kind of a eclectic um, contemporary philosopher. Um, I don't know yeah, if that helps. So that kind of that helps because uh, I was going more towards the challenge between uh, um, seeing a bed and, and seeing a picture of a bed in a mirror. And then, uh, so I thought about, you know, seeing a, seeing a Shakespeare play live and then having a DVD of it. And, uh, and at what point is, is it always production or is it not production? And, uh, and, and what point do you still maintain some of the essence of the, of the play when the DVD is, is not, does not work without a DVD player, without a TV and a few other things to make the whole system work. And so, sure. so I was getting really goofed up. And then when you start getting into these meta concepts that are being kicked around nowadays, it gets even worse as to what's production and what's, what's, uh, what's reality. So, so that's, that's where I was getting lost. Uh, the Schrodinger equation, the problem with, is it, is it eternal or is it just a mathematical model that, that, that actually only works in, uh, in limited situations, which is the measure of the problem uh, is, is still uh uh, a little bit more relevant. So thanks. Yep. Yep. Okay. Joe, did you have a question there? I just wanted to get this clear in my own mind. Uh, and as you continue to talk, I was waving my hand and you continue to talk and, and you continue to give me the answer to my question. So okay. I'm, I'm, phrase, <laughs> I'm, I'm, pra I'm phrasing you, but they, they, it's not complete. I'm talking about the wave equation. Yes. Uh, my first impulse when I heard you lay it out was that, ah, uh, oh, yes, he has discovered this element that's true about reality. And he's able to put it into a mathematical uh, phrasing, uh, which makes it very precise. And if I'm to try to categorize this as I'm fishing here, I can say he's found a new form that fits into Plato's uh, collection of forms. Uh, and this is, you know, he sees the waves 
it, you know, the equation itself, it just describes a general situation, but it, it is found in specific instances anywhere somebody looks for that phenomenon. So, so I, it, so, what's real? Yeah, I, I understand the, 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 thing, plateness. I understand the, the plateness point, side of it. The, the point is that no, nobody, nobody was looking at a whole bunch of patterns to come up with that. It's the other way around, right? You're looking at the forms. It's a, it's a very simple and natural thing in the math itself, right? And uh, that something uh, so elegant and simple with so few elements and no moving parts and no ability to change anything without wrecking it should elegantly describe so much. Now, only in certain situations, as Craig correctly points out, um, but should elegantly describe so much doesn't look like it can be an accident. And it doesn't look like it's something that you could have put there. It's not artificial enough to, for you to put it there. You didn't construct it like a car. It doesn't have 400 moving parts that you adjusted to get the thing just right. It's got four parts and they have to be you know, one way or the other. And there's one way around you can put them and it snaps into place and explains 80% of reality, right? And the supposition is this has to be natural it has to be mathematically true, and it has to be the way the world actually works. Because there's no way for something that simple and, and that clean to be that powerfully accurate if it's not actually corresponding to something. And the thing that it's corresponding to is just a piece of math, right? So people talk about this as the, the unnatural effectiveness of mathematics is the typical phrase that is used, right? Why is math that is that elegant, that accurate? You could imagine that you would need ridiculously complicated math to get a close approximation to anything, right? And for some situations you do, if it's a complicated enough situation. But for th those sorts of things that I'm talking about, that's not the impression you get. It looks more like you're discovering a math, something like a mathematical bone of the world, right? And it looks like discovery, not invention. And it looks like it's something made out of math. Um, the earlier uh, philosophers you know, said that you know they, they felt like that the, uh, they were learning the the, the language of, of nature itself when they were learning mathematics, and that's the kind of impression they're talking about. Now, there are people who have philosophical disagreements with that understanding of mathematics or that understanding of physics, whatever. Um, and you can argue that uh, the, the physical theories that uh, themselves are changing and what counts as elegant is getting more complicated and, and so on, right? You can, you can quibble, about, quibble about it around the edges. But certainly if you're talking to the people who are deep in the, in the math, these are the kinds of impressions they have. The elegance of something um, is evidence of its naturalness. It's the kind of impression they get. Does that help? Okay. Um, Chuck. I have one question, though, oh, on that. Okay, okay, sorry. Before we get to check, then, Jim, quick. Yeah. Uh, what would be one mathematical uh, equation, or that you would say falls into that category? Well, I mentioned the wave equation as one, but I mean, it, it's just a simple example. Okay. I'm, I'm picking. I'm picking something from physics. I'm picking something that from you know physics that people were surprised it had it had to be like that for it to work at all it's not what people were looking for or expecting right it had behavior it and and consequences that were you know difficult for them to even comprehend initially even though the math was simple right so it's it's difficult to believe that you just put it there if you can't even understand it right <laughs> i think we'll do it and I would say, right. in, in well, the, if someone like S equals MA, you could believe you could could have put it there because yes, it's that simple, but it's also so simple that you could have expected it. And you're really just saying something about second derivatives or something like that, right? And mm -hmm. something like that could, you know, yes, it has to be somehow uh, still true, um, but it's 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 so simple you could imagine, you know, uh, it, it having some sort of uh, artificial character as just a first approximation to things or something like that. And there may even be some element of that from 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 the later more complicated ones, right? But when, when no one was expecting this and it has bizarre consequences you can't uh, uh, begin to fathom and it explains everything and it's very short and if you move one symbol, it's gonna wreck everything and it's not gonna to correspond to anything at all, mm. then 
you kind of get this the idea that this is something natural that's been discovered. And that would be say in contrast to set theory, you'd say that's something created. Well, that's a difficult one because that's more like a, it looks more like the foundations of how we think. It's not necessarily about the world. I mean, set theory seems to be is it, something, is, pr pr something primitive about how we think. Would, would that qualify as a language? In the case of set theory, certainly. Or even but, even the wave function. It's a mathematical construct. It definitely, it definitely, it definitely uses a language. But the language that was the language it is written in, right, was invented for an entirely different theory. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, I, I, don't, I don't. I don't want to get too 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 far afield on a particular point uh, point of of of, of, of theory. I, I'm just it, mm. the 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 general topic is the unnatural effectiveness of mathematics is taken by a lot of people, uh, serious people, as evidence that Platonism is not so trivially dismissed as uh, some people in the history of uh, philosophy departments uh, might might think, right? You will find plenty of you know uh, lead, leading mm -hmm. mathematicians and scientists who take it much more seriously than than lots of continental philosophy departments do. Um, I'm gonna put it that way for these sorts of reasons. Jack, uh, <clears throat> I'm getting ready for a two week trip out of town. Um, a lot of it focused on a major set of corporate uh, paperwork I have to produce as the secretary. Um, and then last night I got another last minute um, Chinese translation problem thrown at me. So I haven't had a chance to catch up on the reading, but I will okay. eventually. Okay. Okay. Always, always uh, uh, love waiting for your questions. And as, as before, if you want to give them offline, it's not a problem. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, did we already do you, Joe, or do you, I don't, can't tell if you moved or? You don't know. I don't think so. Go ahead, Joe. I can't, I, I can't manipulate my mouse. Uh, yeah, my <laughs> question's answered. Uh, I've been distracted as Czech was talking uh, because I actually looked up Wikipedia wave equation uh, because I learned a lot. I just scanned okay. it. Thank you. Sure. Uh, do you want to give other first impressions? Uh, I, I, my first impression was a, a gigantic confusion. Okay. Uh, and, and as Rose got into it, uh, first the clear, it became more clear, especially the second, the, the production chapter in this lecture in the second, that, that became more clear and it fits in, in now much better when our, we've had our discussion. Uh, the third chapter uh, sort of rolled over me. Uh, I mean, I, I, I read it each paragraph maybe twice. Uh, and when I'd finally gotten through it and said, okay, I've read this now, uh, I, I turned immediately to the uh, Heidegger book on, on the cave theory, the second book. Uh, and I got it at page 33 and I was beginning to pick up something more of what's going on and integrating the two lectures, as it were, I mean, the two presentations. So thank you very much for making this much more clear, much more clear in the last hour. Okay, good. Um... I definitely want to talk about chapter three when we get there. Um, to me, the big things in three, I mean, obviously this is the cave stuff itself, but the other big case is um, there are kinds of charges uh, from Heidegger about Plato or his or what happened to the Greek understanding of truth with Plato or after Plato that um, uh, we had something like an ex the experience of um, actual illumination of truth from a background darkness that was there in the notion of Aletheia being covered over, going away, being replaced with the uh, focus just on what appears afterwards. Um, this can wind up being a linguistic version of uh, what appears being covered over by our linguistic descriptions of it. That's the sort of uh, Aristotle version of you just have predication coming out. <laughs> um, but even before that, there's this notion that the you only see the beings, you don't see the fact that you can see the beings appearing, something like that, or that the beings appearing has to be torn from the background uh, uh, darkness, something like that. That's a, a claim you get in uh, in some places in, in, in Heidegger um, about this sort of change in understanding of, of uh, Greek uh, experience of truth from the, between the pre-Socratics and the post-Socratics. Um, and then uh, it's also a related question of um, uh, does 
uh, Plato do full justice to the temporality uh, of the experience of the discovery of truth, to the fact that it's an event, that it's something that happens in someone's life in time, that, that truth is unveiled to them, something like this. The active voice version of all that, the appearing as a, as a historical happening. Um, and that's also related to um, Heidegger trying to understand some of these things in terms of the background structures of the life world or the analytic of Dasein and, and the, the importance of understanding all that. What a lot of what Rosen is trying to do in chapter three is show that those concerns are not alien to Plato. They're there, but you have to look for them, right? The, the analytic of Dasein in, in Plato is the analysis of the soul and the doctrine of Eros. Um, and you find some of it in, in, in the Phaedrus and some of it in the symposium, um, the, the, the whole idea of the ascent to, uh, uh, to contemplation of the truth. So there is a whole doctrine of uh, something like this, um, the fact that it is a, a temporal embodied passionate creature that's doing this thinking. That's a central part of the Platonic dialogues. Um, it's just not you know, often an ontology chapter because Plato is not Aristotle. He doesn't write treatises. He writes dramas. Um, and then similarly, the, the notion that uh, the truth has to be torn from a background of darkness, that's the whole point of the allegory of the cave, right? So to claim that he missed it is to miss you know, this, you know, his, his central allegory of what philosophy is like and how philosophy you know, uh, is, a, is a complete disorientation from, uh, compared to uh, ordinary life, ordinary experience, ordinary uh, perception, right? Um, it's because that's the whole point of his central allegory, what philosophy is in the, in the Republic. It's, it's obtuse to say that he doesn't get that you have to uh, tear philosophical truth from a background of, of, of uh, deception and darkness, right? So the point that uh, Rosen is making in that chapter is not that those concerns of Heidegger are false concerns to have, to be philosophically true to things, you have to pay attention to those aspects of the human situation and trying to understand the truth, right? But Plato does pay attention to them and the charge that he has not is just false. You just didn't look for him in the right place. That's the claim. Um, but we'll, we'll get to the other things that are going on in that chapter. But you, you talk about how that chapter was hard to say, see what it was because rolling over. If you don't know the charges that he's trying to answer, it can be unclear why he's laying this stuff out. He, he, there's particular charges that uh, he, he, Rosen, thinks Heidegger makes against uh, Plato's um, failure to understand things that he, Heidegger, had understood, or that the previous Greeks had understood. And Rosen, you know, because he uh, knows uh, Plato cold, knows all the places where those topics come up, right? So he, he goes to those other places and says, of course, he talks about that here. That's the point of this passage. That's the point of this passage. You also get his, you know, quips along the way, which is, you know, the reason that Heidegger didn't already notice this is because he's a, uh, you know, he likes Aristotle and Kant and long didactic treatises, and he doesn't understand, you know, uh, Platonic, playful Platonic dramas, or as Rosen likes to put it, it's because Platonic dialogues are populated with living human beings, not hermeneutical descriptions of ontological activity, right? Um, and so there's a culture clash and temperament between the way, uh, uh, Heidegger approaches these things in the way Plato does, but it's not that Plato doesn't care about them. Anyway, uh, I hope that helped. Uh, Jim. I didn't read enough to have much of an impression because I, I sure. read the introduction. I just started chapter one. I just got the book the other day, so I'm going to listen and learn, and it's already been interesting. Maybe towards the end, I'll have more questions, but I'm very intrigued to find out what happens in chapter three and your thoughts on it because I'm really excited Okay. Um, just on what I've heard so far. Great. Uh, Penelope, first of all, welcome. And uh, you probably learned the format for now. Sorry to leave you for last, but we're still doing our first impressions. Did you manage to do the reading? That kind of thing. Penelope, you have to find the mute button. Don't know if she can hear me. I think she said she was far away from her uh, mic, so it may uh, may not be easy for her to jump in. Okay. Um, I 
have problems with, with the PC, no problem. Uh, shall we come back to you or, or just skip? You can type something. Okay, we'll skip, no problem. All right, so let's talk about chapter one. Um, we're going into like, you know, uh, uh, what's here. So um, uh, chapter one is all the stuff about the, you know, the title name is Aristotelianizing Plato. And we already talked about this a little bit that the, the claim that um, fundamental claim of the chapter is that the the guy who comes up with the idea that truth is only truth about propositions is not Aristotle. It's uh, sorry, it's not Plato. It's Aristotle, mm -hmm. right? Um, the other, and that's sort of maybe the most obvious thing we've talked about a little bit. The other thing which is definitely going on in this chapter is that um, Rosen is trying to relate all of this to um, more contemporary analytic philosophy. Um, he mentions Quine in particular, but he also mentions other other people in that whole tradition. Um, and if people aren't as aware of that tradition, it may be uh, unclear what, what he's doing there. But the point is that the this tendency to uh, understand uh, metaphysical questions logically and linguistically is a pronounced one in that whole school of thought, right? The, the, there is a definite um, tendency in Western philosophy, maybe metaphysics, maybe even trying to get away from metaphysics and replace it with logic, um, that uh, uh, is a, a even more accentuated version of this Aristotelian tendency to turn all questions of um, metaphysics into questions of how you talk about things precisely, right? So um, there's a, uh, uh, he talks about the, the, lo the locus of, of criticisms of, of metaphysics being precision. Uh, and he's thinking of, uh, the, the analytical philosophers who are expecting uh, more mathematical precision than they get from uh, Plato and Aristotle, let, uh, let alone the uh, uh, continentals. Um, but they're, they're, uh, they're partisans of precision, I can put it this way. Um, uh, and they're expecting that um, more precise speech is going to result in greater clarity of thought about, about uh, metaphysical meaning, something like that. Um, and uh, the thing to notice in all that is that he's kind of agreeing through that whole section with Heidegger's criticism of a lot of that modern philosophy, right? Heidegger is, is um, looking at all that modern philosophy and saying basically, um, people are people's concern with ac uh, original access to truth has disappeared. They're not looking at anything like uh, uh, human original access to truth. They're just focusing on the um, uh, the consequences of human activity that is constructing what we decide counts as true, something like that. The rational way to talk about these things is, and then you give some prescription of a of a, a logical form that should be followed, or a, or, or a metaphysical schema that uh, makes sense of things, right? Um, and that uh, tendency in modern philosophy, Rosen is agreeing Heidegger has the number of that in the sense of calling that something like um, a spirit of techne that is covering over anything like original access to truth or original understanding of what truth is with the products of our own linguistic activity, right? So in a way, this is Heidegger's criticism of this tendency of metaphysics generally um, that you know, truth has disappeared. Truth has been replaced with syntax, and we uh, we were just arguing about the precision with which we can talk about things, and for, um, that's what's substituted for talking about the essence of uh, essence of things. Um, and Rosen is basically endorsing that uh, that criticism of that tendency of modern philosophy. He's agreeing with Heidegger that yes, that tendency is there. Yes, it's pernicious. Yes, it's a falling away from uh, uh, un understanding of truth. Um, and it's fair to say that this thrust is there in the history of Western metaphysics, right? So it's important to understand that in all the places where uh, Rosen is disagreeing with Heidegger on his particular charges against Plato, he's not disagreeing with that charge, right? There's, a, there's an element of the sweep of what uh, Heidegger is saying about where, where metaphysics has gone in general in the West, right? Where uh, Rosen kind of agrees with him 
that uh, it's 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 a downslope, right? Uh, Aristotle, may, uh, sorry, Aristotle, Heidegger might put the the, the peak before the downslope at, at the pre-Socratics, and uh, uh, Rosen will put it one move after at at at, at the Socratics, right? Um, but they're both agreeing that it was better then than it is, you know, with uh, with Quine, right? Um, uh, or, uh, or or other such things. Um, okay. Uh, so was that was that aspect of it clear? Of you know, where there's a point where they're effectively they're both ancients in this regard. I'm not saying that Heidegger himself is an ancient, but uh, Carlos, question. Well, that's part of my confusion. I have to acknowledge, probably according to the description, that I must be Aristotelian because I can't see how you can address the concept of truth unless you verbalize it. You know, this uh, Aletheia three is uh, is uncovering. Uh, I thought that if, yeah, if applicable to a proposition yep. that reflects so, reality, then that's Aristotelian. But what I fail to understand is how you could, and again, this is probably due to my lack of a philosophical background, uh, how you would address the concept of truth if it weren't with subject predicates. Right. So, so, so the, 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 basics, the basic claim is that um, all your speech about things that is trying to help other people to see things first assumes that there is a something that you can see that you can help show them. So there's a whole doctrine in uh, Heidegger of you know, what apophantic discourse tries to do, uh, the kind of discourse which is trying to show people the being of things. Um, and that it's uh, the way that it works is you have to independently have already seen the thing you're discuss discussing you have to then try to describe it to someone else and they have to come to their own view of it. And there needs to be an original experience of the phenomena by the first experiencing subject to have anything to communicate and by the second one for any communication to have occurred. The words can't carry it. Two, okay. mind, two minds are required and a reality that they're both touching. So. So the the all, I can, all, all I can expect to do, all, all I can expect to do is trigger that correct. event from that other person. You can only help them to see it. Okay, I get it. And 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 this is exactly being contrasted against the idea that whatever is true about something could be captured in the words, and then smuggled off into the words and reproducible by a monkey, a typewriter, anything that could read the words. Okay, yeah, I get it. Right. I get it. So, so Chinese room fashion, right? You, you, we have to have an experiencing subject, a dot sign, a mind that can see the can see the reality, that can see the being uh, of the thing, and then tries to communicate that in ways which are, you know, meant to prompt the same phenomenal experience in the second experiencing subject. And if you if you can do that, then you can actually communicate something about the real thing. And if you don't do that, you're just dancing mm -hmm. around it. And the, the yeah. dance, the dancing around it might get, you know, glancing blows of a few facts about it, but it's not going to get the actual experience of anything like full, full-blooded truth. That uh, answers a question that I'd written out in the book. Uh, on page 20, he says in the middle of the paragraph, says and uh, Description is given to cognition, not constructed by it. So my, my, my question was, how do you do <clears throat> phenomenological, phenomenological description without predicate, pred, predicative propositions? Yep, and the answer is, you know, uh, as, as a Platonist with a full-blown sense of intellectual intuition, right? Uh, uh, your mind has to first have access to the phenomena and then, uh, there, there is, there's what's given to you in that experience. There's what is revealed to you in that experience. And uh, the point he's making in that sentence is you don't construct that. You don't construct it as a linguistic product, right? You, uh, you first have that, right? That, then, then from those uh, phenomenological givens, you can try to construct um, uh, discursive formula to, to help communicate it with other people, which are always going to be interpretations. They're yeah. always going to they're always going to have you know mm -hmm. some uh, partial aspect that's going to you know 
rely upon the other person supplying large portions of what's uh, left out um, because they have they can create their own independent access to the thing. Um, this is uh, this is kind of well, I mean, I, I, to me, it's very momentous because in essence, we go back to what we were talking about earlier. And I don't want to take up too much time because there are other people's yeah. other opinion opinions. A, all I can do is trigger in somebody else a glimpse of what I perceive. That's it. Right. That's, the, then, that's the, the, the utmost extent of communication. I cannot expect anything yeah, else. Yeah, 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 yes, as to the communication part of it, but the, there's a more basic thing there, which is what this means is that the actual experience of truth is something more like a uh, uh, personal silently experienced revelation than it is like a, um, uh, it's not a stream of words uh, uh, passing from a page to into a head, right? Now, there are different registers people are playing on here of what the role, where, where's the role of words and where's the role of something like vision or intellectual vision? Because words do matter in ways besides the communication things. We use them to think too. We use them to organize our thoughts too. Right? The ideas themselves are ways of trying to construct concept-like things that we think about abstractly around the things that we denote the same way, right? So there are other things going on in language and how language is structuring thought here beyond the, you know, I tell you what, uh, I, I give you predicative uh, sentences. But the, what you find in Aristotle is the idea that, you know, you, if you want to tell something about, tell someone about something, something you just have to create, uh, you know, uh, truthful predications about it. Um, mm -hmm. And there's only a few different possible categories you can predicate about. Uh, predicate in terms of, we can categorize them all, well, there's 10 of them, right? We can go through for each one of them and you can tell them, you know, the answers to those, you know, some subset of those 10 questions, and that will tell you, uh, tell the person all the things that they can know about that thing, right? This is way too simple to begin with. The other, the other thing is even in Aristotle, he knows that the most important of those, when you try to tell someone the essence of something, they have to be able to see that essence themselves. Um, in Aristotle. Um, there's some people after Aristotle who just want to turn it into just linguistic predication. But in Aristotle himself, when you're saying that, you know, uh, Socrates is a, is a rational animal, right? You have to be able to see what a rational animal means. You don't see rational animal by first seeing a bunch of animals and then seeing rational because you won't see rational that way. Rational isn't in the animals. You have to see a rational animal before you know how, that there can be one. You have to know what reason is first. And how do you know what reason is? You've seen a reasonable person. You've seen Socrates, <laughs> right? So uh, yes, you can then know linguistically that that's the kind of thing that's being referred to, but your access to the essence, rational animal as a unified thing is not something you construct out of just two words. You have to see them together and see their belonging together and see that they belong together as a one thing, not two things in an instance like Socrates. And Aristotle, right. so, so Aristotle subscribed to that and it went downhill after him. Is that what we're talking about? Uh, that's the way Rosen presents in the chapter. Rosen mm -hmm. is saying Aristotle still has this notion of intellectual or noetic intuition like that, where he thinks that you have to have, that your intuition of essence is required for you to be able to tell the essential things from the accidental things. You can only tell that, you know, where saying where Socrates is is not the same thing as saying he's a rational animal and tell the rational animal is in a central predication of Socrates, whereas, you know, in the left corner of the room right now is an accidental predication of Socrates. Your ability to see that difference, right, your noetic intuition of those things, and your ability to see that essence and see that it applies to him, all of those to Aristotle are a noetic intuition that your common sense can provide, right? And People call him the common sense philosopher for multiple reasons. One of them is he actually has a doctrine of common sense, but um, and and it means this kind of thing. Um, it's it's used to ascribe uh, unities of meanings to the, uh, the to the material particular. The material particular is the main thing that is uh, uh, for for uh, Aristotle, um, and it's it's the, the the being as the subject of the proposition. Um, 
So there is this element that's very linguistic, right? He's got this whole doctrine predication. He's, you know, he's, his, his main thing is the subject of the proposition. He's, you know, codifying logic. A lot of it is moving in this very linguistic direction. But at the same time, he still has this residue anchor of there's a there's a uh, a job for the mind to do in putting together the uh, the mere words about things with the things that they're about. That is still a from Rosen, uh, Rosen's point of view a crucial role left for intellectual intuition. Now Rosen thinks even that is a decayed role for it because he thinks in Plato it has a much more serious role. And he thinks that in anything like an original experience of truth as Heidegger is describing, it's pr practically the whole role, right? And the, 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 the linguistic predication afterwards is almost an afterthought of the interpretation, right? But something like a, a, uh, uh, a direct intellectual seeing of the phenomena, right, is, is there in uh, all three of them. It's just getting weaker and weaker compared to the linguistic stuff in Aristotle, Rosen is saying. But Rosen is seeing that, that decline as happening in Aristotle and not even being all the way gone in Aristotle. It's really gone by the nominalists and, and positivists later who want to sever that link because they don't, they don't believe in that thing. They think that that's you know, too arbitrarily different from the language and they want to say, yeah, really you're just thinking about it in terms of words. Right, that's the typical the typical later tendency. I don't know if that helps. Much, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So we talked a little bit about the the people besides Aristotle. We talked about what uh, 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 Aristotle um, is doing the doing here. There's there's um, uh, what's the other thing he's going he's doing here? He's he's also pointing out that although uh, this, this um, linguistic focus is much clearer in Aristotle, um, and that's an aspect that Heidegger seems to be blaming as, this, uh, as a uh, degradation of the original concept of truth into this correspondence uh, 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 truth, um, still uh, temperamentally, Heidegger is likes and is more comfortable with Aristotle more than he does Plato. He's less comfortable with Plato. He's not finding all the ways he agrees with Plato, and he's more comfortable in the uh, uh, Aristotelian stuff. And he mentions also Kant because these are these you know rigorous treatise treatise uh, writing philosophers, just like Heidegger is. Right? They write these long treatises of you know detailed analysis of some phenomena, looking at all the different things someone had previously uh, said about it. And that's the way he, Heidegger, acts and thinks too. So the point is that uh, temperamentally and, and in how he, how he does philosophy, if you look at the two, the one that Heidegger is more like himself is uh, Aristotle. Um, so anyway, uh, so it, it's striking that he's, he has the temperament that's more, more Aristotelian, but at the same time, he's, uh, um, uh, blaming that kind of philosophy. And, and uh, when I say blaming, I mean the linguistic tendency in philosophy is something that Heidegger sees as, as a, a decline, but at the same time, it's also the kind of philosophy he himself does the most. Um, there's a place there where uh, uh, he, he has this quip, it's on page 10 and 11, about um, uh, Heidegger gives the impression that there's no real access to Plato except through Aristotle, because Plato just isn't clear, and Aristotle is the guy who makes him clear because he's logical. And, and he asks, uh, one wonders whether Heidegger would agree that the best way to approach his own work is, for, is via uh, Derrida or Gadamer, right? Uh, probably not, right? Um, so he, he, it's, not, it's not, a, a, not a tendency that he would uh, be comfortable seeing applied to him. Uh, he also mentions that uh, he, Heidegger blames the tendency of um, Plato to uh, uh, use myth as opposed to um, clear, sober uh, treatise writing. Um, but despite that, Heidegger himself mostly focuses on the myth uh, parts of, Pl of Plato's, the things to uh, discuss, like the uh, allegory of the cave. Um, but he also um, uh, 
has a tendency towards the uh, the romantic poetry himself, right? He's he's got lots of the romantic poet in him and lots of the uh, uh, lover of myth in him, you would think. Um, but he, it's like he's down on that tendency in philosophy. He thinks that's that's a that's a um, an enthusiast, we saw at the end of our previous book, it's an enthusiast's way of doing philosophy to, uh, as opposed to the sober uh, uh, work, uh, work a day, you know, uh, 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 version, which is what you get with Kant and, uh, and Aristotle. Um, so he's, he's blaming a tendency to uh, mythical and poetic thinking and philosophy, but he also probably engages in quite a bit of it. Okay. Um, and a lot of that is just this uh, this point I was making about the machine gun brief of you know all the different ways in which he has equipped to he can he can uh, give give to Heidegger uh, he does. Um, are there other things people want to bring out in one? Otherwise, there's uh, I think we want to uh, jump to two. Yeah. I heard someone speak up. Sorry. No, I was just saying two, two loud. Okay, under two. Can I can I say a few things? Please so, go down. So first, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it struck me when I read this that like Heidegger never jokes. Like I read so many books and there is not a single joke there. He never talks yes. about, I don't know, something is not, he's almost not human at all. And and uh, and I, I, I thought it was funny. He tried at some point, he wrote a book of dialogues like in Plato style, but I guess he gave up. He tries once, it was country path, country path conversations. It's, I, I found that funny that he tried to, to imitate Plato and go with that, but he gave up, obviously. One thing there on page three, you started with, you know, with mathematics. Yes. And it seems like uh, both Rosen and uh, Heidegger, they, they strongly agree that mathematics is it's, it's construction. It's a human project. They, 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 they feel like this, this obsession with exactness over uh, unconcealedness is it's exclusive to mathematics and that's pretty much the, the modern metaphysics it's it's represented by mathematics so so i partially agree with you that rosen says that here but i think it's incautious about the nature of mathematics so um there is a there is a tendency for mathematical logic in philosophy right to be this constructivist rigor school right but that's not the same as uh, what the mathematicians themselves think about mathematical truth, right? Um, uh, if you want a book on the topic, uh, Plato's Ghosts is a, is a good example of, um, uh, of this. It's a, uh, just various mathematicians talking about what they think about uh, uh, the nature of um, mathematical truth. Um, but uh, uh, Kronecker is an outlier in thinking that God created only the natural numbers there. That's a, like an early 20th century tendency. Um, he does, he, he rose in when he talks about, you know, how wild modern uh, uh, mathematics gets. It, it uh, says that uh, it, could, it could lead one to believe that the mathematician's paradise is not Platonist, but dangerously Nietzschean, right? That's the uh, construction of sentence you're talking about. And uh, um, so, so Rosen is, is, um, Leaving open the possibility that uh, uh, math could be seen as, you know, just a constructivist playground, um, but I don't think that that is um, the. I don't think I think there's plenty of mainstream mathematics which doesn't agree with that, especially the, the mainstream mathematics used by physics. Um, and yeah, uh, so Rosen is not himself a mathematician in this respect. He's a Platonist, but he's not a mathematician, and the the. The best person to talk about this would be like an actual mathematician. And the actual mathematicians will tell you the one thing that they can't stand about the constructivists is that they're always denying that things are discovered and pretending that they're made when they're discovered. And there's no question that in the actual experience of um, discovery of new mathematical truth, this uh, direct intuition of the object understanding um, is crucial. Um, it's and it's a lot of it is very visual. Now there are different kinds of mathematics. There's some kinds of mathematics like algebra that are more syntactic and more um, verbal-like, so to speak, um, as opposed to the geometric, which is has more of this tendency that I'm talking about. Um, it's in a way more visual. But um, anyway, uh, if you if you uh, raise the question of um, uh, is truth constructed or discovered 
uh, with mathematicians and physicists, uh, you will find a surprising percentage of the mathematicians will come down on the on the uh, not constructed side. Is what I would say. Um, more than you would expect from philosophy departments. This this also like is that book that um, the critic of artificial intelligence by by that guy if I forgot the the Berkeley guy who who, who took down the artificial project we criticize it and pretty much he he's going into dispute with the. Uh, with those engineers and uh, the and they all like they don't see their their own assumptions. So that's the point. Like if you if you work in a field like that, mathematics or you you don't take necessarily they take what they say. You you look at what they do and what they they assume for and what they take for granted. So I guess my point is, should we try the should we trust the mathematicians when they said that that's what they are doing or should we? Should we, I don't know, look? Oh, it's, it's a fair question. And the reality is, I mean, a significant portion of the mathematicians are not philosophically sophisticated in these things. They may not have the philosophical language to describe what it is that they're doing. Um, I think there's a, 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 there's a definite difference. Um, how do I put it? Uh, there's a, a hierarchy of levels of sophistication about these kinds of questions of truth, philosophically speaking, among mathematicians. Many of them have very, very conventional opinions about it and are just trying to go with whatever philosophy they think is, you know, acceptable in their department, whatever uh, kind of thing. And they don't, they don't care about the real true questions. They just want to do something, discover something new. Um, but the ones that actually think about it, anyway, I, we, we, we can, it, it's an open question. I, I, I think that there is plenty of, uh, plenty of evidence for it, uh, but not everyone will agree with me. That's certainly true. <laughs> sure. All, all, all great philosophers took a stand on either extreme or mathematics. Some of them dismisses as purely formal and some of them took it as the, the highest form. But yeah, I, I see that. It's, it's, it's difficult to come to an agreement on what, maths, what mathematics is doing and how, how, I don't know, fundamental or formal it is. Yes, fair. Sorry, what did I miss? Did I miss something in the chat? Okay, great. Um, the bed. So this is the place where we're on, on chapter two for a second. So th this is the place where I personally find this to be the weakest three, three chapters. I mean, it's it's kind of directly about the issue of are there ideas of artifacts? Um, so why is this why does this matter? The first reason this matters is because it's uh, Aris, it's not Aris, it's uh, Heidegger's first you know text for claiming that. Um, uh, Plato, uh, not Plato, Plato Socrates clear, clearly believes that uh, there are, uh, that idea, ideas and production are compatible because he lets there be ideas in the bed. Um, but the, the question is, how about it? so it's, it, in some sense, it's clear that artifacts are made. And in another sense, it's clear that if the ideas are meant to be eternal, they're not made, right? So that's the standing problem, right? Can you, if, 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 if created, not eternal, and vice versa. Um, so, sorry. And what you get in the chapter is places where um, Rosen says things like, um, uh, to grow the idea of the bed is clearly beyond the capacity of, of, of a human being. Right? That's why uh, uh, this, uh, Socrates ascribes it to a gardener god who grew the uh, idea of the bed in the, in the garden of ideas, right? And, and this seems like wildly out there, right? It's, a, it's, it's an incredible reach. Um, and the question is, why is there this incredible reach there? And Rosen's basic theory in the whole chapter is that there's things going on in book 10 of the Republic where this, where this comes up in the first place, which are all part of the, the drama of the dialogue and what's happening at that point in the, in the dialogue. And there's a political context of it all. Um, and basically the uh, uh, Socrates wants to pra praise the craftsman at the expense of the poet. The, the thing to understand about book 10 of the, of the Republic is that it's all about the quarrel with poetry. It's the, uh, it's the um, uh, philosophy and poetry uh, fighting over whether or not the poets get to stay in the in the city or not, um, and that's the sort of general top, uh, subject matter of uh, of book ten. And the uh, the craftsman, the demiurgus, is brought in as a 
example of a producer who is closer to the philosophical because closer to being true than the poetic, who is the uh, uh, the mimetic craftsman, uh, or the mimetic artist, not craftsman, the mimetic artist uh, who makes things up, basically. Um, so the question is, uh, uh, is, is there uh, is their craft grounded in something true or is it uh, uh, made up? That's the basic, the basic uh, underlying problematic of the, of, of the chapter. The reason this is weird is because nowhere else in Sonic Corpus do you get ideas of artifacts. All the other examples of the ideas in the, in the dialogues are things like a natural virtue or a natural kind, right? You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, human beings, rational animals. It's, it, it's uh, uh, the idea of the good, it's beauty, it's justice. You know, those are the kinds of things that, are, that have ideas in the rest of the platonic dialogues. Beds don't in the rest of the platonic dialogues. But in this one chapter, beds get ideas, right? So, uh, and so that's that's the the underlying problem. Why is that a problem? So the the um, the charge of of productionism, if I can put it this way, is that uh, you have a notion of to be as to be produced, which is something like to be designed. There's some notion of the uh, the the architect maker, this is what you get in Philo, the architect maker of something uh, 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 designs it looking to its blueprint, right? And the designer blueprint of the thing is the idea of the thing. So the idea that the being of something is its essence, which is its blueprint, is the underlying idea here. And you can think of blueprint as the place where idea as something which could correspond to the truth behind things and, and be naturally known. And something like the plan of an artificial construction will coincide. Okay, so the question is, what is the being of blueprints? And do all, are all the, are all the ideas just a version of the blueprint notion? So Rosen is reading Heidegger as thinking that Plato thinks of essence as blueprint. That's the basic idea basic claim here. So, and then Rosen is going to say, well, I don't think ideas in, uh, in general in Plato are blueprints. And he's going to go all different ways, which are not blueprints, right? They're not, uh, they're not picture copies. They're uh, something that are more have to do with the, uh, the, I've got it this way, the um, uh, functional essence or power of the thing, right? So they have this, uh, this um, uh, equipmental contexture sort of character in Heideggerian terms. Right, uh, they're 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 functional and teleologically understood. They're not just pictured, right? But that's a minor point, honestly, because the the, <clears throat> the idea that uh, um, ideas don't have to look like the things that they are uh, uh, the ideas of, right? The the noetic, uh, the way in which the noetic course uh, uh, essence of things corresponds to them is only metaphorically. Uh, related to like a visual metaphor or copy, right? It's, it's not the idea that the thing has a plan. Okay, so when he's uh, trying to differentiate uh, between um, uh, a photonic idea and blueprint, I think he's on okay ground. The place where I think he's weakest is there's um, there's lots of what I call statements against interest here. When he when he brings up the uh, the way in which um, uh, the being of something is its power, right? This is actually getting quite close to the productionist metaphysics on its own, right? Uh, he, this actually comes out of um, passage in the Sophist rather than in the Republic. It's the Platonic, uh, not, it's the uh, Aleatic Stranger who, who says that the two different uh, camps will agree upon being as the being of something is the uh, the power to affect or be affected that it has. That's what it needs to, in order to uh, have, have a being. Um, the other thing here is he's always trying to distinguish between something which, was, which is the work of the craftsman versus something which is the work of nature, but he still calls it the work of, right? He's still thinking of nature on the analogy of human work. And he says, but wait, nature works with different materials, but it works and it works with materials. So the idea that there is a working of materials that just reforms a natural uh, a natural stuff 
as, as the way in which nature as well as um, the craftsman uh, forms the beings, that's closer to the core of the idea that um, Heidegger is getting at as the productionist metaphysics than, uh, than I think Rosen understands. The, 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 the bringing to frame, the framing of things is the, is the kind of uh, primitive in the German that he's thinking of when he's talking about production. And the other thing that Heidegger is always trying to line up this um, uh, notion of to be is to be produced with is the is the his his techne idea, which is also related to his criticism of Nietzsche or understanding of Nietzsche, as the power idea, right? It's it's uh, tech, uh, technology is a an updating of uh, things as will to power, which is the power and the uh, and the techne are the same thing, uh, the powers that the thing has. So the idea that you understand everything in terms of a a, te a techno technological concatenation of their powers is what Heidegger means by the production of metaphysics. And I don't think that uh, Rosen is entirely sensitive to what that understanding is here. He's thinking of it just in terms of, is he saying that it's produced or is he saying that it's uh, 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 uncreated? He's, he's thinking in terms of the platonic dichotomy of um, has an origin in time or is eternally. That's Rosen's background um, horizon on which he's thinking of the distinction between the produced versus the not produced. But uh, Heidegger is thinking of primarily on the line on one lines of this. Is it shaped, formed? Is it a matter of uh, uh, a crafted <clears throat> power, whereby crafted we mean both in the sense of made and in the sense of um, shaped, we say informed, right? Information is, what, uh, is what's being dealt with here. And the information that is making these essences is what is forming things. And by the time we're at uh, Aristotle, we're just going to have form and matter being the things that are put together to make the, the, the full substance. And you're already pretty darn close to the full productionist metaphysics at that point, because you're saying that whatever reforms the thing changes its being, right? <clears throat> so, um, okay. And the place where I think that there is um, justice in Heidegger's charge that even in Plato, there is something, um, there's something of that crafting notion in his notion of essential being is in the notion that it's form itself, that it means for things to have ideas. The fact that it is form, definition, outline, um, dialectical meaning of a concept even uh, in, in the platonic dialectic, all those things are, they have this uh, form, shape, um, character. What do you form and shape? You form and shape um, unformed matter. You form and shape, you know, uh, ab abstract, uh, abstract geometric form as well. But both of those are, um, uh, understood on the paradigm of the putty that one works with, right? mentally speaking. So the, car the carved mental putty as that which is given definition and the definitions that they're given as being the shapes that they have and those shapes that they have being their different essences, I don't think it's unfair to say that that's already there in Plato. Even if he thinks that the natural forms have some eternal nature to them, the mere fact that their forms is being defined by this um, potential mutability of shape, if that helps. So that's why I think this is the weakest chapter, because I think there's a place where Heidegger's charge is not met by Rosen because he doesn't really understand it. He doesn't really get what the, he, he has too superficial an understanding of what Heidegger would mean by a productionist metaphysics to know the ways in which even platonic form qualifies for it. Now, the place where I think Rosen does have a point here is when he's talking about this distinction between um, uh, to be created versus to be always. I think that to be always is in, it's part of what Plato intends by the notion of ideas. He wants the ideas to be things which are always. Um, people like uh, Nietzsche, could you know deny that he can manage to do that 
you could want it to be always, but you know, it, it isn't actually from the standpoint of a, of a, of a sort of Nietzsche criticism of Plato. But Plato is Plato's own intention does make much of this difference between the created in time versus is always. Okay, I want to pause for questions on any of that because they've just went through quite a bit and I realize some of it could be hard. Is it clear what I'm trying to say? I think I got he Rosen doesn't doesn't manage to do in the chapter, Carlos. And I don't know if you remember what you said, but you you used the word concatenation of two items to yield what Heidegger called production. Do you remember what you said? Uh, the, the, only, the, only, the only mile marker that I have is the word concatenation. Okay, sorry. Uh, 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 I, don't, I don't quite know exactly which part you're talking about, but the, 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 I was talking about the, the forming or the Herstellen of things. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the point is that, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the, notion, the notion that you are, uh, you are for, forming things out of uh, a potential something like that. But mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, the productionist metaphysics is about the, uh, I think I might've been talking about the, the techne and the, and the power yes. part. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah, okay. Now I get, now I, now I remember where you were at, where was that? So, so the, 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 the productionist metaphysics claim on Heidegger's part is part of trying to explain the history of Western metaphysics as culminating in techne or technology as its understanding of being. Right, so it's got an endpoint. It's got an endpoint of um, uh, a technological understanding of things. Um, what is that technological understanding of things? It, it, it understands everything as being some kind of uh, raw material or standing reserve that is orderable for purposes according to whatever powers are, are informed or infused into the things. Right, so that that notion of uh, of what everything is at bottom, supposedly in the technological view of being, right, is kind of what he's getting at by techne. And the claim of productionist metaphysics is that you're, you're kind of already headed there, right? So the question is, what starts you heading there? Um, and you're, you're all, you're full blown there by the time you're at uh, Nietzsche, right? Um, but I can make the case that you're already partway there as soon as you've just got form and matter, yeah. right? Um, which is, you know, as early as Aristotle and maybe earlier. Okay, Craig. Thank you. No, on the same same line, uh, that's one of the things I flagged on page thirty-three. In this way, the craftsman or the technetes is a common sense anticipation of the philosopher. Um, but contrary to Heidegger's view, the heart of the anticipation lies in the subordination of production to noetic intuition. Once more, what we intuit is not a picture, but a function or a power. Yes. That, that was the one that I flagged that sort of started making a little bit of sense out of that chapter. Yes, but I mean, here, here Rosen is distinguishing sharply between the notion of a kind of correspondence uh, theory of truth, which is like a picture blueprint uh, uh, theory of it, as opposed to one which is a noetic understanding of function or power, which is like a fu more functionalist or um, teleological planned, you know, un understanding of essences of things, as powers of things. And Rosen is convincingly arguing that uh, in Plato, you have this functionalist, uh, you know, uh, teleological purpose of things, uh, powers of things notion, certainly by the time of the sophist, if not in uh, uh, the Republic. Um, okay, but the question is, Rosen thinks that that means because it's not a blueprint, because it's not a picture, because it's not a you know uh, meant meant to be uh, um, a photocopy, right? That it doesn't count as uh, it doesn't count as uh, productionist productionist copying, something like that. Um, but that's not what Heidegger means by productionist, right? something which is uh, um, a technological concatenation of powers kind of view of things um, is fully productionist editor. And uh, so Rosen thinks he's stepping out of the way of the criticism by moving from the pictures of things to the functions and powers of things, but he's not actually getting out of the way because Heidegger's waiting for him there too. That's the kind of 
understanding that Heidegger thinks of as technological understanding. Does that help? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, because I always had the trouble that uh, that blueprints are are only a step in the process to me. Uh, they yes. they are a, a statement of intention to fulfill uh, in, yes. in your building of something. What the blueprint represents, and the and the blueprint is more a guide than anything real in itself. It, it represents the intentions and the uh, and the desire to not screw it up. You know to. Uh, you, yes, you and you have, to, you, you have to, you, you, there's lots of things that have to go together besides the blueprint in order to actually use the blueprint to actually construct something. And, uh, and, and, and the, 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 the engineering formula of, of performing the work of actually constructing the thing is always more involved than just, you know, the plan. Uh, the, 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 the point here about functions and powers, though, is that um, uh, the, the, the essences or natures of things are more like functions and powers that they have the, that we manipulate uh, in terms of um, articulating and arranging those functions and powers to work, right? That's how we construct. We construct by bringing different functions or powers into the relation to one another that we need them to have in the, in, in the scheme, something like that. And it's easy to see the scheme aspect of that but there's also just a bringing together and letting function aspect of that. And Heidegger is fully sensitive to the letting function aspect of, um, of technological working, so to speak. Um, so uh, I don't think that Rosen is, has a deep enough understanding of what Heidegger means by technology to have seen all of that, to have seen that that's definitely still part of what Heidegger means by technology. Um, and by and, and sort of productionist metaphysics. Yeah, one of the other things that I got distracted into was uh, uh, getting a copy of A Question of Technology, uh, and uh, Lovett's introduction to that was wonderful. Uh, and uh, and I'd say he probably did a better job of explaining Heidegger than I was getting out of Rosen here in, uh, in that introduction that Lovett did. I would always expect Rosen to give you more criticisms of Heidegger than explanations of Heidegger, <laughs> but yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's clear that Lovett is a little bit more in love with Heidegger than, than either uh, Rosen or, or maybe Walter Kaufman. Uh, that, uh, yes, yes. He, he, he had a much more positive statement to make uh, in yes. spite of the flaws that he picked out too. Yes, it's fair. Um, okay, uh, were there other reactions to the the, my claims about what is and isn't done in two. I realize I'm going a little fast, but so, Pete. I, I just wanted to say with this thing of the forms and they're producing things, I actually came across this in software engineering in the 90s, and this <laughs> might resonate with some people. There was something called object oriented mm -hmm. uh, programming. And there the notion is that you create classes of things like an employee. And you say an employee has properties, first name, last name, email address. And then what your software does is create instances of those. Mm -hmm. And one of the books I read in the 90s referred to Plato's theory of forms and said, okay, there's the form of something and then you create an instance of it. Mm -hmm. And when I'm thinking of the theory of forms and how it produces things, I always fall back uh, yeah. to that. Sure. You define a class and then you have particular instances of it. You define a, a bed and then there's beds out there in the world that were produced from the class bed. And that's right, blueprint is like too specific. Class, and you have a right. drawing of something. Right. Uh, but the software one, I think is closer to Plato. So you yes. have classes and instances. Yes, you have classes and instances, but the thing, take your example of you, you make a little ontolo ontology for an object of an employee, right? You're actually able to anchor that into something else, right? So if you just had the collection of those attributes as a little set in your software and the only instances of it were the number of rows in the database you created that were employee instances, you'd have not employees, but a, a, a table labeled employee, right? You don't actually have full-fledged employees yet. 
the thing that makes any of, the, the, of those platonic maps correspond to anything real is the, is the notion that ideas are performing two things. They're letting our mental maps be in correspondence with the external reality because they're both in correspondence with the idea. And they're also driving how the actual thing in the real world works. So there would have to be an instance of your software uh, designed object running around inside the employee for the analogy to be correct, right? So when we're doing these things in software, which you're right, we do all the time, we're doing it just as, the, as mapping one side of it, right? As some a way of referring to it. The platonic idea is that that same thing is not just a way that we map the world, it's supposed to be part of the machinery of how the world itself actually works. And, 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 and the ideas that we use in our maps are supposed to correspond to the causal things actually operating in the patterns in things, right? The DNA version of the pattern, as opposed to the, uh, your, your, tape, your, your, your database table of the DNA, uh, row, of the rows of someone's uh, uh, alleles, right? You can have your table of all their alleles, right? But there's also the pattern in them, right? When those both correspond, then you're cl getting closer to the platonic notion. Does that help? Yeah, and I guess in the sense, if you have an employee instead of the software, you could say the employee is built from the pattern in their DNA, <laughs> right? And then their DNA is contained within the employee. But but I think this will get to the problem of metaphysics is that it, it like works great for math that if you say well i have two apples plus two apples i have four apples two plus two equals four it just works metaphysically you don't have to have apples to do the math uh but then you run into problems when you have metaphysical notions like that don't exist in the real world like let's say gender and race. And that's where metaphysics becomes a problem where something doesn't actually exist in the real world, but is now guiding how people think about the real world. Sure, you can have things in your maps that aren't there in the reality. Similarly, there can be important, you know, causal things in the reality that aren't in your maps, right? Because your maps are incomplete, you haven't captured something. But the, 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 the philosophical slash theoretical role that the theory of the ideas is trying to do is to explain at least three things at the same time. One is how we can have a, a veridical understanding of a pattern in the world, right? So the thing in the world and the thing in our, uh, our uh, lookup table can be in correspondence with one another formally because they both they correspond to each other because they both correspond to a third thing that the pattern that they share, right? The second thing is how the thing in the real world can actually operate inside because it uses information, it has information in it, right? It, it, it does information like things, right? It's not just a description of those things. Those things, things are actually causally operative in the world. And the third thing, the hardest thing is our maps actually corresponding to those causal things. Right? It's one thing to understand the world. It's another thing for the world to operate that way. But if the two are actually in correspondence, the things you touch and the things that actually move in the world correspond. Now, ideas are a dream that those three things can line up. Right? Um, is that always going to be the case? No. But it's, 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 uh, if it's possible for it to be the case, then an accurate map can get it right. That's the, that's the fundamental platonic position of why they think ideas are a sensible thing. They're trying to explain both that you can have this kind of uh, true knowledge, there could be this kind of information pattern like structure of things. And if you have both of those correct, the things that you think you are manipulating purely abstractly can inf information point by information point correspond to the actual causal pattern in the world. Right, and it's you can see why that can become a technological idea. You can see why that can be close to a notion of technology in Heidegger's sense. Right, it's not completely crazy to see that that could be a basis of a um, a technological understanding. 
if you think that all of our maps are just, um, you know, lossy nets, loosely thrown over things that don't correspond to anything in the underlying reality, because there isn't any information in the underlying reality, it's just chaos, then you're not going to be able to, you're going to have only conventional notions of what truth is. You're not going to have notions of truth that, that get, uh, are falsified or are correct based upon whether or not they correspond to the actual information patterns of things. That's one. And you're also not going to have the test of them of do they can I prove they correspond because the way I think the thing works inside and the way I formally touch it correspond and it responds. The proof that I understand how it works inside is that my map is an accurate index to what part of it will react what way when I touch it. Right. So that that's the. I mean, it, it's, I'm just trying to explain the platonic dream, right? The, re the reason why people have this notion in the first place, the reason why some of the early modern um, mathematical physicists were Platonists, right? People like Galileo, right? Uh, was they, they thought that they could just get that guess right. And by getting that guess, guess right, be thinking of and have their abstractions exactly correspond to the actual causal machinery behind the world, right? Um, and that, there's all kinds of ways in which that uh, dream decays and also all kinds of ways in which people um, don't think that that dream makes sense, if I can put it that way. But that's the dream they're talking about. Does that help? Yeah, and so to make sure I got this right, so uh, in terms of the theory of forms, and we're saying theory, but as I understand it, Plato and or Rosen, or Rosen is saying Plato really believe that there's a realm of the forms and they're, the, they're really there. It's not just an analogy for how we uh, identify things based on categories, but Plato and Rosen actually think there are forms. Sure, but in the but in, in the same sense, they think that there's mathematical truth. They think that the thing in your software table and the thing in the DNA helix are both in correspondence because they're both corresponding to a purely mathematical truth, a purely mathematical shape, and that pure mathematical shape existing independently is how the two of them can be in contact with each other because they're both in contact with it. It's how they can correspond. But saying that actually exists, the sense that exists they mean there is not that they you know, exist in Timbuktu, right? They exist in the same place and way that the wave equation exists, right? There's some realm of mathematical truth in which that, that instance or form or shape, right? Is, is a real thing that can be in your software table and can be in the DNA helix and can therefore be operating in both of them in the same way. It's, it's trying to explain how something like an unusual effectiveness mathematics could happen. I mean, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was itself a development of and a refinement of the previous Pythagorean idea that numbers were the secrets of things. The secrets of things were numbers, right? The Platonic ideals are ge generalizations of, of Pythagorean numbers that are meant to have this um, individual essence character as opposed to just a purely mathematical numerical character. That makes sense? Yeah, and then I think that's where it gets into trouble and that's also confusing the, the other <laughs> side besides the mathematical direct sense, the essence, um, it sort of gets confusing where this is, is essence uh, the same as the idea or is it ADOS? And it seems that in some places, idea and ADOS are synonyms, but in other places, they're separated. And that's sure. certainly a source of confusion. So, so, so uh, two, two diverse. So when, when, when Socrates first explains these as a young man in the Parmenides, right? He's asked by older Parmenides, what, what do you think these ideas are? And he says, well, uh, I think there, there, there could be thoughts in minds or they could be patterns and things. The answer is both ways. And, and Parmenides says, you're gonna to have to find a way to make those both the same thing or this isn't gonna work, right? Because he's only you know, 17 when he has that notion, right? But Plato already knows that these have to be something like thoughts in minds and something like patterns and things that are in correspondence. 
the traditional criticism of all of that from Aristotle and the Aristotelians is that you're just talking about abstraction, right? And, and this is just a way of talking about abstraction. But abstraction is always this lossy, messy thing that is, you know, conventional and saturated with your own, you know, uh, biases and, and a lack of understanding and guesswork, right? And linguistic thinking. But all you're able to do is um, have generalizations, which are abstractions, which only actually exist in your head. So, from the Aristotelian point of view, the material particulars are real. The ideas aren't. Ideas are real, but only in heads, right? So thoughts are only in heads and truth is only in judgments. So all the things that, that Plato identified as being about mathematical truth and being about truth in general, he moves inside a subjective sphere of mind and language, right? So it's that move of that whole sphere of what's meant to be an articulated truth that's between the, uh, the world and the mind entirely into the mind pole as an abstraction and as language that Aristotle accomplishes and you know thinks of as his you know big improvement over Plato because he's made it more real and he's made it, he's made it more less he's made it more less flighty so to speak but from the standpoint of a Heideggerian this means that he's gotten rid of the whole betweenness that Plato already had Heidegger is all about the betweenness involved in the contact between mind and reality, right? Uh, and and that's that sign has to be always already outside. Aristotle is all inside. Mm -hmm. Aristotle has moved everything inside. He got rid of all of the things which are you know unbelievable uh, because they're claiming that these things are real when they're clearly just abstractions. But the cost of it is he made everything about truth subjective and linguistic, right? And yeah, no, no, that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Carlos. Uh, I had a question that I've written down on page 38 <clears throat> regarding the idea of um, functions of powers of, yes. uh, of forms. And the thing that popped in my head is what is the function or power of a circle or any to be equidistant from all of its points. <laughs> that's what I thought. And actually, that's what I wrote down. It says, is it its definition, the locus of points that are all the same distance from one other point? So, sorry, uh, which, which particular place are you on page 38? I, I was looking at page 38, the uh, second paragraph, and that reading that second paragraph, we're talking about the bed and the, you know, holes. Talk about the function of beds, yes. Um, yeah, and then and, 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 we, uh, and, move, and, we move from the understanding that figure, of that figure. Sorry. No, go on. So, it, it, so uh, yeah, he's reading he's, the whole thing. Right. So, the, the main thing he's trying to get, get at there is just the difference between the form in the sense of the visual form, the purely physical, geometrical, physical form of the bed from its functional powers, um, uses, uh, technological, whatever, um, uh, its functionality, right? So, so functionality. There, uh, Beds are uh, items for sleeping upon that require a certain degree right. of softness and a certain degree of firmness and a certain size and whatever. Right? Th those, mm -hmm. those functional requirements of something to be bed-like right, are not the same as a picture of a bed. Right. They're not yeah. the same as a particular shape. Now, there are particular shapes that might perform that function and others that would be too narrow or too sharp to perform that function. right? So there are correspondences between them. But the, but the picture over here is one thing and the function that it performs is something else. And what Rosen is trying to point out here is that the essence of the bed, the idea of the bed is more that function thing and it's not the picture thing. Right. So Plato is often explaining how these essences work on the analogy of a geometrical form, but that's just an analogy. It's not the explanation of what they actually are, right? What they actually are is this functional significance kind of uh, um, uh, technical role and requirements, whatever you want to call it. They're equipmental contexture nature, right? I need something of this size with this hardness, you know, uh, and, and, and whatever in, in, in this position, yeah. right? With this durability, whatever. 
if I've got that, then it performs the function it needed to perform to, you know, be the bed-like thing here. And, and more complicated objects have recipes that are collections of those things, right? Uh -huh. And yeah. that recipe is not the same thing as an exact blueprint that only is fulfilled if, you know, the line is exactly here, not exactly there. They don't have that, they don't have that, um, uh, not just precision, they don't have that sensitivity, right? <clears throat> they're, more, they're more robust than that. Um, they're more general, they're more robust, and they, they, uh, uh, they're only trying to capture a, a more essential thing about it, right? So if it's got enough of those essential things about it, it counts as that thing, yeah. right? That's why you can have multiple instances of brave acts that all count as brave acts. There's not only one brave act, and if you deviate it from slightly, you're no longer a brave act. It's a, it's a general class, right? Anything that falls into that set is in that class. So it's that, it's that set-like functional power use dynamism, you know, uh, nature business that he's trying to get out of this paragraph. And he's trying to distinguish it from something like I took a picture of it, it's this shape. So only something that shape counts as a bed. Yeah. Yeah, I just took it, uh, I, made, I made the jump to the you know, very basic concept of a circle. I said, what is its function and power? The only thing I could come up with is the definition of the circle. Sure, but I mean, it, you, you can, um, yeah. Uh, it's usually better if you pick something which is more, um, I don't know. Uh, Less abstract? No, it can be very abstract. But I mean, the, 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 the typical um, platonic examples are, they're thing like, things like virtues. Yeah, okay. Right? Um, and you know, which get very abstract, right? But uh, they're not mathematical. They're not geometrical, right? They're supposed to have this tr the same abstract truth-like character, but it's not because they're meant themselves to be made out of um, mathematical definitions, right? The idea of justice or uh, uh, or virtue is not the same thing as the idea of two or the idea of circle. They're both meant to be class concepts that have definitions and instances, but uh, it's not because uh, you know um, uh, bravery is made out of numbers. Okay. Okay. <laughs> These are fair, fair questions. Um, I had a question. <clears throat> Just so I'm no, yep. So is is the basic conclusion at this point that um, Heidegger hasn't proved that it's all production, but Rosen's way of trying to show that is lacking. Rosen's way of trying to show that there, it, there isn't a productionist metaphysics in Plato hasn't succeeded with me, in part because he ha doesn't have a broad enough understanding of what Arist of what sorry what Heidegger means by productionist. Okay, and also because he hasn't really gotten at this fundamental question of um, something like form, um, whether or not something like form is already enough to be on the road to the thing you put together with matter to make instances in the full Aristotelian way. Because by the time you've got that, I think you might be there. And, okay. and, and it's not clear how much you have to add to Plato to get to that. Okay. You might you might have to, and and there's certainly lots of other things in Aristotle which are farther down the road, but Heidegger might have the the foot in the door he needs, just with the notion of uh, you're looking at the functional power relations of things which you're thinking of as forms, and you think of everything if you think of as forms as things which inform things, and the things which are in forms are instances which are material which are you know the the mere stuff that you move around with your information and your forms. If, you've, if, if that's already there in Plato, then that's most of what Aristotle needs to get us off to the technological races, so to speak. Aristotle has other things he's going to do there, which are knocking down things which uh, uh, Rosen likes about Plato and I like about Plato in terms of this correspondence stuff with ideas. 
that Aristotle himself doesn't agree with because he thinks they're just abstractions. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and Heidegger doesn't have that in Plato, right? It would not be fair to see those things which are only there in Aristotle as being in Plato. But something like the notion that um, we understand nature as working with material, uh, you know, and uh, being a, 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 something which forms and informs things by working with them, that's already darn close. Okay, so I was just confused because I thought the whole um, discussion about mathematics being discovered and the wave like function showed that Heidegger is wrong if he thinks it's all production. I, I, I think if uh, I think that that's true of some mathematical truths, it's true of some you know, uh, physical understandings of uh, platonic truth. I, I agree with that. I, I think that he has not shown that. Okay. How, how, what's, what, what's the way of thinking about this? How um, discovered, eternal, unmade like is uh, natural truth to Plato? That's the real question. And uh, Pl Plato and Rosen are trying to say they're um, not, not touched by human hand, something like that. Okay. And, and someone on the other end of the extreme, like uh, uh, Nietzsche is saying, of course, it's all touched by human hands. It's all human ideas constructed and projected for human purposes. You're just too much of a coward to sign your bill and say you're the one who did it. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Um, so you're ascribing it to the nature of things or to a God in the heavens or to the gardener who grew the bed, right? When everyone knows that a you know, bed was invented by someone who wanted to lie down, right? Yeah. Um, so, so those are the two extremes, right? Yeah. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. But it, it's, so, so, it's, so it's a draw so far. No one's going to have a match. It's, a, it's the sixth round. Plato's got three rounds. So far, so far we're, we're only two rounds in. We got a six oh, okay. round fight and we're two rounds in because we're in oh. chapter two. We're going to chapter okay. three with Parousia. You know, there's a real interesting thing in what you just said, the okay. way you were talking about and using the word informs. Yes. I finally, I finally caught inform. Yes. And so much of what we talk about is information. Yes. We exactly. put inform into. Uh, where is the form within that? And uh, yes. uh, that, that that caught me as one of the tricks in the language. Even even when we talk about it, we talk about the uh, informing of what's going on. The, Absolutely. The putting form and, into. And and what what Heidegger picks up on is that in German you're often saying "stell" uh, there, um, and and you know the, the in framing the, the the framing you're putting on things. That, and and that that becomes his Heidegger's technical term for the mode of revealing or of truth appearing under the technological understanding of truth. Um, in framing becomes the way in which truth appears. Um, but this is related to the you know truth becomes information. Um, but. So you're absolutely right that form and inform, uh, which are Latin words that we use in English, are 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 picking up on this. Uh, on this, they're 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 uh, stell and stell like words in German are doing a similar thing for Heidegger. If I can say something about like Nietzsche, and you just mentioned it, he he takes like takes on Plato on the the, the modern science. He says something like the. The 19th century was not the victory of science, but the victory of scientific method over science. So it's kind of like the, the human project to, to change everything according to like to our will. So in a way, like these ideas probably are not real. Maybe are, maybe are not real, but we make them real by changing the reality to, to correspond to them. So we go kind of the 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 production here is we change reality to 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 map to back to this these constructs that we have like both platonic and scientific that's exactly that's exactly where nietzsche is coming out and that's exactly the the the, the view that heidegger is going to um react to as 
being, you know, uh, technology, at its being, you know, mankind uh, exalting himself to the posture of Lord of the Earth um, at the very moment when he is losing his contact with being, because he can only see his own product. So he's alone with himself. Um, and why is that a danger from Heidegger's point of view? Because mankind is on the verge of becoming raw material in his own eyes, um, as opposed to being uh, as opposed to being some creature that has a uh, uh, an exalted destiny in truth, he's becoming just another orderable piece of raw material to be technologically manipulated. That's the sort of gravamen of the uh, question concerning technology essay. The other thing that you can see examples of this at the very end of chapter two, what we we're just talking about, this is, um, uh, Okay, uh, at the end, very end of uh, 41, stated as concisely as possible, a metaphysics of production entails the dissolution of the difference between philosophy and poetry. That's what you were just talking about there. That's what Nietzsche wants. He wants philosophy and poetry to have their difference dissolve so that the poetry we write determines what shall be, right? We're going to write the future of the world like a novel. And uh, you know, it's gonna be our will that determines what poetry legislates what into existence. Right? And uh, Rosen continues, more precisely, philosophy turns into poetry. The natural is order is replaced by a historical sequence of poems. What can then be called the being or the mode of presentation of the being of poetry is history. That's what replaces uh, uh, you know, the, the um, awareness of, of anything like an eternally true being becomes the history of the different cultures of the different projected human wills that Dan was just describing. Then Rosen continues, we cannot rank order the historical sequence of poems because all standards for such an ordering are themselves poems. Even the edifying invocation to escape the nihilism of poetry is itself a poem. And perhaps worst of all, the origin of poetical thinking or discourse is not discourse, but silence. So his point is that if you end up in the uh, Nietzschean, uh, uh, we will create whatever we will soup you will end up with a, uh, a, a history of poems, which are only the will to power of their producers that were conceived in silence and propagated to the world. And Heidegger warns, by the way, the human beings involved in that picture will be viewing each other and themselves as raw material, right? So that's- also, the, yeah, Sorry. Yeah. That, that is another- crazy saying of Nietzsche, he said something like, well, we are going to try an experiment to throw and the humanity will perish. So let's go on, go on with it, something like that. Yes, he also said science is not yet built cycloptic buildings, but the time for that too will come, right? So he, he's, he's perfectly willing to play uh, uh, dice with the future of humanity in these, in, in these regards. And uh, Heidegger is a little bit less uh, sagoin about that, if I can put it that way. But the, the the, the notion that there is something at stake like a uh, turning what counts as what human beings understand or experience as truth into something they think of as just their own creation and just their own willful creation and just their own fiction, right? That is definitely you know, at stake here. That's something that Nietzsche is you know, con consciously plays with. There's ways in which, by the way, some of that also goes back to Hegel, who's kind of had that same idea about what the future of a world governed entirely by a sovereign public opinion would be like. But um, uh, and, and in some ways, Nietzsche is just uh, emphasizing that that won't be completely rational as opposed to what Hegel thought. Um, but uh, yeah, the, 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 that's the, that's the uh, when, when Heidegger, is running around charging that Western metaphysics is ending in uh, uh, a metaphysics of production. The reason that is not just like saying, you know, and, and the day will end in why is because it's these sorts of consequences that he's expecting from that Nietzschean eventuality. If we all become Nietzscheans like that, then some of those consequences are, are what uh, he and others expect. Okay, and, and, and that may make clear why people like Rosen and people in his, in his camp 
are interested in viable positions in the tradition previous to all of this, in which there was some stable notion of objective truth that could be rescued from this historicist tendency from their point of view, right? They're looking for hand, uh, handholds that don't go down that slippery slope. Excellent questions. All right, uh, three, Perusia. Okay, to me, this is Rosen's strongest chapter so far. Um, why? And it's partly because here he's, there's charges that uh, Heidegger makes that are along the lines of, if philosophy is serious, it has to notice this thing about the nature of truth or this thing about the nature of, uh, of uh, uh, the situation of man or something like that. And the things he wants are, are perfectly sensible things to want. Um, there, there are things he tried to do in the existential analytic of Dathlein and so forth. Um, but his claim that Plato hasn't done them are just false. And here, I think Rosen has his strongest case for showing that uh, Heidegger's concerns are fully addressed and in some ways, perhaps more adequately addressed by the Platonic corpus than by the Heideggerian corpus. That's something people can disagree about, but certainly that there are such parallel things in the Platonic corpus as there are in the Heideggerian corpus, I, I think is clear, right? Rosen sustains his case here. Um, an example is on page 55 where Heidegger you know, uh, says that the what is being question is dependent on our antecedent question to who, who is Dasein, but that's just an ontologicalized version of the Socratic question, who am I, right? There's a whole doctrine of the soul in, in, uh, in, in Plato. There's a whole uh, doctrine of eros. It's uh, parallel to Heidegger's doctrine of care. Uh, there's a whole understanding of the, uh, of the uh, passionate nature of that soul, just like there is a notion of uh, uh, mood as coloring Dasein in being in time, right? Uh, Plato is a psychologist, at least as much as uh, uh, Heidegger is. His psychology isn't the psychology you find in being in time, um, but it's uh, it's at least as developed a psychology. Um, and similarly, his understanding of the um, look at this way the 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 temporal uh, uh, throne character of of the world in which uh, uh, philosophical understanding has to arise, right? That's all through the whole Platonic corpus, right? Which is full of, as, as Rosen puts it, you know, living human beings, not ontological activity. Um, so on all of that, I think he's basically unassailable in this chapter. Um, the, this then leads to, at the end of it, the places where he starts getting um, uh, more directly engaged with uh, some of the later Heidegger stuff, uh, the, I think of the 32 Heidegger, Heidegger stuff, the quite essence of truth stuff. Um, uh, where he gets to the allegory of the cave. And we're gonna get more into the allegory of the cave in the whole next chapter, but he's already got a, a first pass on the allegory of the cave here, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> where he's claiming that um, <clears throat> uh, what's the key point? The key point here is that uh, the allegory of the cave is trying to say something like, uh, uh, yes, the natural situation of uh, of man is something like a, a darkness of uh, the truth being concealed and the truth has to be wrested from that darkness in, by, in a, uh, a painful and often involuntary process, something like that, right? But that's the whole point of the allegory of the cave. And the, the strongest version of this claim is uh, made for the very end of the chapter, I think it's on um, 64. Um, this is, uh, mm, near the end of the first full chapter, uh, chapter, uh, first full paragraph. In short, pre-philosophic cognition is indeed productive, but the whole point of the doctrine and ideas is to refute the metaphysics of production. And it does this by distinguishing being and the images at the various stages of the cognitive process from which we escape only through the vision of the ideas. What's the point there? Rosen is claiming that the, uh, that the, uh, the way in which the, um, uh, if you're only living in the world of your poems, right, 
if you're only living in the world of the human projects that are just a series of, uh, of poems we just talked about out of Nietzsche, that's the cave. That's always been the cave, right? The, 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 the objects whose shadows you're seeing on the wall, those are words. Those are the stories that people tell about, uh, uh, tell about words, right? And, and you, most of your uh, ordinary cognitive uh, thinking is you can only see the shadows cast by uh, 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 words that other people created as artificial constructs to be about natural concepts they barely understood, right? And all of the allegory of the cave is meant to be about exactly that, uh, quote, natural state, unquote. But that natural state is exactly what, you know, Nietzsche is pretending is going to be, you know, the great enlightenment of we uh, finally realized that we weren't deluding ourselves about anything and that everything was conventional. Well, the fully conventional world is always available. It's called the cave. It's the natural situation of man. The question is, is there anything else? Is there any outside the cave? And Rosen's point is the doctrine of ideas is designed to be a dream that there is something outside that cave. There is something more than a purely conventional series of uh, historically constructed you know, human poems. There's some truth you can actually get access to. Okay, so I, uh, to me, this is where um, Rosen just is getting a, a point from Plato, which is a very powerful point in Plato himself, that I think uh, Heidegger himself is also sympathetic to. When Heidegger you know, goes through in the, uh, the allegory of the cave in this part, whoop, you know, he's, pretty, he's quite sympathetic to the understanding of the, the basic experience of turning around to orientation towards truth that you get in the allegory of the cave. He, he's not down on it, right? Um, so there's other details in this chapter where you know, Rosen is disagreeing with some elements of how Heidegger reads the allegory, right? Thinks that he's, he's trying to, from my point of view, uh, Rosen thinks that Heidegger is trying to assimilate the categories of the allegory of the cave too easily to the categories that he, Heidegger, found or invented in being in time, right? So he's talked about every day, you know, the, the fallenness of everyday existence, right? He's gonna wanna assimilate that to the cave because that was the, that was the, the background for the analytic of Dasein and being in time. So of course, he's gonna to try to make the, the allegory of the cave be about that. And Rosen's gonna disagree with some of those details. Okay, but, um, Lots of you might disagree with, agree with me on some of these points, but I think that the there's, there's a rhetorical aspect of this chapter, which is he's agreeing with uh, all the things that Heidegger says philosophy should do, and then he's trying to point out, but Plato already does them, right? Including this thing of showing some core allegiance to the original experience of truth that is not just being stuck in human convention, right? That's what the allegory of the cave was about in the first place. So, and if the and if the uh, if the gravamen of uh, Heidegger's, um, put it this way, fear of the nihilism of the Nietzschean conclusion is that it's going to cut off all as, all uh, uh, access to original truth. That is Plato's concern with a purely conventional world too. Right? Where's the difference? The difference is Heidegger thinks that the fundamental experience of truth is something which is still a very, um, it's an event in time kind of thing. And he doesn't buy this platonic concern for finding the eternal as the way that you get beyond it, right? Heidegger doesn't trust that move to the eternal. I think that's partly things he's learned from, learned, influenced by Nietzsche on, right? He, he, Heidegger, um, distrusts the move to the eternal in Plato because of many of Nietzsche's criticisms of it as fake, right, as seeming fake. And uh, so Heidegger is not willing to see uh, reaching for the eternal as the way out of uh, a cave-like uh, um, being trapped in, in, a, in a kind of nihilistic uh, realm of convention. Austin, question. Uh, I just wanted to ask one thing about um, Heidegger's distrust of Plato's reference to the eternal. Yes. Uh, being grounded in uh, some implicit Nietzscheanism. Um, but Nietzsche also has the eternal return as uh, the major concept that drives, uh, drives history forward. Um, 
he does, but uh, and and uh, there's there's places where uh, Heidegger is even down on that amount of eternity in Nietzsche, um, in 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 some of the Nietzsche lectures, uh, and he's seeing that that element of uh, of Nietzsche's philosophy is a way in which Nietzsche had to fill out the structure of metaphysics. Get that in the uh, four Nietzsche, Nietzsche lecture, in particular the fourth volume. I mean of the Nietzsche lectures. Um, but the the place that I'm thinking of, especially we, when we just finished this, the uh, the um, uh, basic problems of phenomenology, there's that section uh, toward the end there where he's you know vehemently claiming there's no evidence whatsoever, whatsoever that there is any access to anything eternal here, right? And time is the proper uh, uh, horizon upon which we understand anything uh, like being, right? He Heidegger is um, firmly in the historical or historicist camp. And so is Nietzsche. Yes, Nietzsche talks about, you know, uh, uh, poetically about eternal return. He talks poetically about, you know, uh, a love of eternity in 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 in, in Zarathustra, but he's still fundamentally a uh, a kind of um, poetic historicist philosopher. If I put it this way, there's different cultures with their different uh, 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 moralities, in, in, in Nietzsche's case, um, uh, that have their span of time and then go away, right? And that sort of um, uh, cultural historical relativism that you get in, in Nietzsche as foundational to his historic sense or something, I think is just still there in, 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 in Heidegger. I think he agrees with it. Um, the other thing you notice is that um, Nietzsche is trying to abolish the distinction between the real and the apparent world. And he thinks that what will be result afterwards is the real world. So the, the real and the apparent world was a distinction made by Plato and it's a false distinction and uh, the world of being and becoming, we get rid of the world of being, we have only the world of becoming, the world of becoming becomes the real world, right? Okay. You can see some aspects of that as the move to start with from phenomenology, the move to start from immediate experience and to see that as the world, right? So turning the whole world into the world of the becoming, into the surface world, into the world of the phenomena is a way in which Heidegger is following in Nietzsche's tradition, in my opinion. There's lots of other ways in which he disagrees with Nietzsche, but in this tendency to keep that historical sense, I see him as in the same tradition. Does that help? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Joe, your question. You're still on mute, I think. You came off mute, but your mic's off. You don't know how to get it back on. Okay. Can't hear you. Try uh, uh, unplugging and replugging or something like that. See if you can get it to restart. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, so he, he he disappeared, I guess. Yeah, I think you unplugged more than more than he thought, and we'll hopefully come back. But uh, do you have a question? Yeah, well, just my response to this chapter. Sure. It's, I, I I see Rosen as interpreting Heidegger through Plato, and my main guy there is there's too much emphasis on darkness and visibility. Uh, which you might think reading passages in Heidegger, he, he might also, you know, the clearing, oh, that's just light. Uh, but in, there's places where Heidegger pushes back and says, well, don't just interpret this uh, as uh, a visual thing. And I, I think my question would be in Plato's cave, uh, where would blind people fit into this? Would they be completely not taken by, they can't see the wall, they can't see the shadows, so they're perfectly normal, or <laughs> they don't exist at all because you have to have vision to see in the cave? I, so, so it's fair that there's a lot of visual metaphor. Um, the uh, because the shadows, the, the, the things, the objects that are being held behind people, that are the artifacts that are showing, they're casting the shadows are mostly meant to represent words 
So it's using a visual metaphor, concepts, whatever. They're using, they're, they're using a, visual, a visual metaphor for the way in which language actually structures thought too. So, it, it, but it is using a visual meta metaphor for it. There's no question. But uh, a, a deaf person might not be aff affected by human words, right? But uh, a blind person certainly still would be, right? To the extent that human thinking is conventional because of being saturated by language and is dependent upon a, a, a culture and a poetry because the culture and the poetry that it receives or is thrown into, you know, is, is created by the, uh, uh, you know, the illusions of the people before it, right? That's the general cave-like aspect, the way in which the cave is like the city, the way in which the cave is like the, uh, uh, the, uh, the human world, because it's, you're, we're, we're, we're born into the illusions of others, right? Um, and we only first see things through the concepts that they have thrown over the world, something like that. That's, that's the fundamental gravamen of the, of, the, of the first level of the cave stuff before there's any freeing into the light. Um, and it's, it's not primarily visual. I do want to get back to the other point about the, the, the lighting, because I think that you're, uh, there is definitely a sense in uh, Heidegger that what he means by the lighting of the clearing is a, a deeper mental idea, not just a visual metaphor thing. But the same is also true of what Plato means by the idea of the good being like the sun in the noetic realm. It's not, it's not meant to be just a visual metaphor. It's meant to be an explanation about how uh, there is a uh, an ordering, causing, and goodnessing of uh, two, two ideas that comes from their being structured around the good, and that is closer to the horizon of the clearing idea in Heidegger than you might think. I think Rosen is is fair on that point. Now, there's no question that Heidegger has a different scheme for this than Plato does. He's replaced the good scheme with a time scheme, right? He has temporality as the horizon which being is understood instead of uh, the idea of the good being the horizon on which being is understood. But they both have this notion of there being some lighting or clearing and horizon in which the noetic is understood, right? They, they share that quite a bit. And I think Rosen is right to point out there's a fair amount of commonality there. And, and you you were making the extent, other analogy that the cave is uh, like the common world, which would be like uh, Heidegger's world of the they. Yes. And being in the cave is being inauthentic would carry on the analogy with Heidegger. Yes, then. yes absolutely. I think so. I mean, uh, he, he's going to get more into the way in which the cave is and is not like the city. There's some ways in which the cave is just meant to be about the sort of um, uh, pre-philosophical um, perceptual situation of man, but it's also meant to be something about the conventional uh, social situation of man, um, because philosophy is meant to be a freeing from that that social situation as much as it is from a you know any earlier epistemological situation. Uh, related to this the, the division on pages 50 51 it's something like an argument said that the more we look at the we shift our attention from the from the process of illumination to the entities that are illuminated yes. this lead us to 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 put emphasis on things that can be measured controlled and put to use and then on page top of page 51 says then good comes to mean usefulness, and then the end of the paragraph says something like, the conceptual grasp of, grasp of wisdom thus moves into technology. So pretty much for, seems like both Heidegger and uh, Rosen, this, this emphasis on vision moves directly into technology. And- right, well, I, mean, so I, I mean, I think that, that for that paragraph, Rosen is trying to explain Heidegger, the paragraph begins for Heidegger then, right? So. That whole paragraph is not meant to be Rosen's own diagnosis of what Plato results in, but is Rosen trying to explain what he be believes uh, Heidegger's charge is, right? He's not necessarily endorsing that charge. But he's saying this is the charge that, uh, that Heidegger makes against uh, the way in which uh, the, the sort of teleologically ordered good understanding in Plato uh, moves into technology. 
the place where that good understanding is talked about most directly <clears throat> in, in Plato for this is it's actually book five of the Republic, right before you get to the divided line and 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 and, and idea of the good stuff before the cave, because there's a there's a discussion there before then when they're moving to the philosophers about the they're not even at the idea of the good yet. They're just talking about the good. Um, and it's a very formal discussion, right? The, the, in Plato, I mean, the, the good is a very formal idea there. And it's, it's, it's not presented as something which is simply comprehensible, but it is presented as something which people always have some notion of already. And uh, Socrates makes the claim that you almost can't talk about without using circular language. Right, you can't talk about uh, uh, what is good about something without uh, using a definition that uses words like uh, good or ought or better uh, uh, themselves. But uh, is it enough that you have an orientation on the good that you end up in technology? I don't think so. Uh, I, I think that uh, to me, part of the aspect of technology <clears throat> is this notion that um, there's an element of pure power calculation in it. And there's an element of <clears throat> the, the, the purpose of the reordering being to further the reordering, right? There's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a self-perpetuating process aspect of it. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm talking about in Heidegger. Um, and there's also this aspect of the sort of nihilistically cut off from original source of truth in the notion of technology in Heidegger. And I don't see that see that yet in just the notion of the good in Plato. I, I don't think that just having any orientation on the category of the good is enough to make something technology. I think there was something what they said that the Socrates, like Socrates, is mentioning, is kind of looking at the sun as as a as an object, not like the the the, the background, and that kind of moves okay. the discussion in that no, way. That, there, 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 you have a point. So, <clears throat> so. In the tendency to reify the good, uh, yes. Uh, in, this, in the tendency to have the, the uh, objects of vision obscure the, 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 the view of the clearing, maybe. <clears throat> but uh, there's, other, there's places in Heidegger where he says, you cannot have a science of ontology unless you reify being, right? You, you, you have to make an object out of the object of a science, right? So if you want to have ontology, you have to reify being. So he's, he's telling you never reify being, and he's telling you can't have a science ontology unless you reify being. So I, I, it's, to me, it's not that coherent a criticism because there's no way to not do it if you want to continue to pursue the philosophical enterprise. The, a place where you could criticize Plato on this is if the evidence would have to be that the objects of the vision has obscured the view of the clearing because you don't understand something like the phenomena of the peering of, of, of truth to the mind or, the, uh, or that as an experience. My evidence against that is the allegory of the cave as the turning around. It, it's talking directly about that experience. So he, he can't be missing that experience when he's talking directly about it. Does it work? Joe, do you manage your uh, audio back? Uh, you, you tell me. Yep, yes. you're a little faint, but we can hear you. <clears throat> oh, a little faint. Oh, you're say. better now. You're better now. That's good. Okay. Yeah, I have a very flaky internet connection here in Tempe. I don't know why. It just it just goes off and comes back on, and I lost everything. Um, the point I wanted to make earlier is really a, a point that's long past our conversation, but. As we go to the eternal idea, yeah, I, we talked about that briefly. Uh, I, I was quite fascinated and very impressed with the idea, the time idea in Heidegger. Uh, it's almost like you could say, as the world turns, uh, he talks about the present, the future, and the past. Uh, and that always struck me as being an incredibly valuable uh, way of viewing uh, now, or reality, or whatever you want to call it. But there are no eternals there. The Earth is turning, um, and is that? Is, am I on track, or am I just make, making things up? No, you're not making things up. I mean, he 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 has uh, uh, downplayed anything like the eternal in the whole discussion of the ecstasies of temporality. 
he, he mentions even the uh, <clears throat> outside timeness of mathematics, mostly in conjunction of, with Aristotle, rather than in uh, he, he himself uh, talks about. Um, and uh, he goes out of his way to say, there is no evidence for anything eternal here, right? In, in, the, in the structure of temporality. So from his point of view, anything about etern uh, uh, eternity is created, experienced, or understood out of negations of things which are part of the structure of temporality, right? Um, is that an adequate understanding of anything like uh, the uh, eternity of truth? Not to Rosen. Um, the, the place where this comes up is especially at the very end of the of chapter three, um, where uh, let's talk about the <laughs> ideas, right? Uh, so we talk about how the cave is an image of, this, of the psychology of cognition, and he says the human being is a creature of shadows, which affect even our vision of the ideas. That's agreement with much of Heidegger's psychology, right? And then this is the following claim. But the ideas are not shadows. On the contrary, they provide us with the possibility of understanding ourselves to that extent, freeing ourselves from the limitation of shadow vision. Now, one could disagree with that dream, but the dream there is that, yes, the, the, uh, there's something shadow-like about all human understanding, something like that. There's something time-like about all human understanding that comes to pass. <clears throat> the things we understand don't have to be as time-like as we are. Right, and uh, the the original notion of, of ideas in, in in Plato and in this passage in particular, it, you can call it a dream if you like, but it is the dream of the possibility of contact with eternal truth, as opposed to being stuck in shadow play. And uh, from from uh, Rosen's point of view or Plato's point of view, Heidegger is just giving you a really accurate description of being stuck in shadow play. Carlos. <clears throat> the first paragraph on page 52, halfway down it, I have a question. It's going back to something we said earlier. Accordingly, the Platonist attempt to surpass temporality by attributing eternity to being leads directly to concealment of, or of self-concealment and not its illumination. I'm sorry, you have to tell me where you are again, 52. Yeah, page 52, page 52, first paragraph about halfway down it. It says, accordingly, the, the Platonist attempt to surpass temporality. Okay, um, yes. Yeah. I. Right, so, so this, it comes this and is, goes. right, so, so, yeah, I mean, so this, again, this is, uh, <clears throat> He's trying to explain the, the gravamen of uh, Heidegger's charge against Pla Pla uh, uh, Platonism. And the, the issue is the Platonist attempt to get outside of time to something like touching an eternity of truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, whereas Plato thinks that that's some hopeful way of uh, escape from being stuck in shadow play and, ma and maintaining an access to a revelation of truth, which in other respects Heidegger is in favor of, that access I mean, but he, he thinks that uh, it leads directly to the concealment of self-concealment, not its elimination. So the concealment of self-concealment, what is he talking about there? There's something about yeah. the uh, 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 truth needing to be torn from the heart of, uh, of uh, self-concealment, which is uh, a uh, a process, it is a historical process. It has to happen in time, it is, it, it is an event. Right, so uh, it is a time-saturated event from Heidegger. From Heidegger's point of view, Plato is trying to talk about something eternal. He thinks that making it more important. Heidegger is like, this is the most important thing that happens in your life if it ever happens once. And its importance doesn't depend upon its eternity; it depends on its onceness. Mm -hmm. Right. So the uniqueness of the event is the thing which is moving to Heidegger. And, and he thinks the uniqueness of the event is being concealed by a trying to grasp to grasp 
to something eternal with it, which he doesn't think is in it. Does that help? Yes, thank you. That's good, thanks. Okay. And that's fundamentally a very different attitude towards uh, not just time and eternity, but a very different attitude towards, <coughs> pardon, pardon me, um, generality and particularity. One of, Heidegger, the that I've, one of the problems that I've had throughout hang on, the whole thing. Carlos, 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 let me finish the thought, please. Sorry. Almost finished the sentence, right? There, there's something about Heidegger to understand, which is that in a way he's a super Aristotelian. A Aristotle thinks that the that the uh, the material particulars are more real than the, than the than the ideas, which are just abstractions. Heidegger thinks that the individual is more real than the particulars. And the and the individual event, the, the individual once is the most real thing. As you move towards the more and more I-like, specific, individuated once, you're moving more and more towards the ontologically real and true in Heidegger, mm -hmm. right? The event is, that's why the event is like his, his favorite <laughs> word, right? Um, the, 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 the what happens once and happens is the most real to Heidegger. And he sees a tendency in looking for everything in generality as a flight from that. So wanting the thing to be eternal, wanting the thing to be about all, all beings, wanting the thing to be, you're always going for something which is a broader, broader, shallower, shallower, less real, less real. Does that make sense? Yep. Sorry, I interrupted a point you were trying to make. I interrupted you. I, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's not wanted, intentional. Well, well, I just wonder if you're back. If you, if you can go back. If you can remember the point you were on. Yeah, the it's just a minor uh, observation. I keep getting confused with the word eternal. To me, that has a connotation of long-lasting infinity of time, when it's really a temporal. Well, there's multiple words for it. Yes, I mean uh, the norm, ordinary meaning of eternal is a um, uh, an everlasting outside time. There's also right. just an That's a the there's also just an atemporal meaning not affected by the category of time, which doesn't necessarily have this everlasting sense. There's the sepaternal, which is is exists as long as time time exists. Um, and these these were all used and carefully distinguished by the by the uh, the era of the Neoplatonists and the and the Church Fathers and all that. Right? Um, they're much less. They're of much less interest to the historicist moderates, if I can put it that way, who have less patience for any of them. Um, they might have a category, they might allow for the category of not affected by the category of time for things like math, but that's about it. That's how we should interpret eternal in this context. I don't think so. I don't, I, I don't think so. I think he, here, here, uh, because he's talking about what Plato is, is, gra is grasping for, I think he means the, uh, the, uh, the, the everlastingly always um, that is, you know, outside the sphere category, but categories by time, but also counts as lastingly always. This is one of the uh, things that uh, uh, Heidegger gets at with the Parisi idea. So, so um, Rosen prefers to quote the term aeon, right? Which is, you know, the, 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 the always being. Um, and that's that's uh, what Rosen thinks is the the proper Platonic term for it, right? Um, and uh, Heidegger tends to uh, associate this with enduringly present or endlessly present, where there's the notion of it being present. So um, and present is includes affected by the category of time, right? But that's that's Heidegger himself interpreting that there is this present time-like character to what counts as always for Plato because presence is part of his concept of being. That is Heidegger's own reading of how he sees Plato understanding being. It's not Heidegger's explaining a doctrine of time you find in Plato it's Heidegger explaining a doctrine of being he sees in Plato. If that makes, if that distinction makes different, makes sense. Yeah. Can? 
Yeah, I was thinking what you said with like this eternal and individual versus general. And I think these days we have this concept like what is true is this this collection of facts, individual facts. And I think it's it's kind of we, we have this kind of eternal in them, like facts are eternal art. Even if they are individual, we, we, we like to think of them as as once we discover them, they will stay there forever. And that, yep, I don't know. Like even the, the AI at some point, they, they thought that that's how they should build it, like have a collection of facts and manipulate yes. those. And I think that's, it's because, still- Because, bit... yeah, you get, you get this at the beginning of uh, uh, the Tractatus by uh, uh, Wittgenstein, the world consists of facts. Yes, exactly. I, yeah, I, I know what you're saying, yes. Yeah, so so it's, it's still facts, it's, it's something individual, but it is loaded as, as it's with, with eternal connotations. To me, like, it's, it's, don't you agree that maybe the facts are, are also itar- uh, individual things versus general? Like they, 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 they can be, but I'm, I'm saying that a lot of the previous, <clears throat> pardon me, a lot of the previous philosophy of metaphysics thinks that it's talking about something more important if it's talking about something more general. And uh, in a way, Aristotle is the first to disagree with that by saying, actually, the particulars are more real than the generalities and the generalities are abstractions. Okay. And I, the reason I say that I feel that Heidegger is you know, a super version of that is I find him going that same direction, you know, like on our rocket ship. He wants to go all the way to the individual event that has only ever happened once in the history of time is the most important thing that happens. Right. Um, so the, the rarity of something does not uh, it just makes it more special. It doesn't make it less important. Is that fair? Okay. And that's a that's a fundamental difference in temp- temperament to me. Um, I don't mean to be nitpicky, but uh, the I want I was confused with the using the not I, I forget the other guy's name. Facts? Are we talking yes. about true true moments of truth or facts? So I don't want to make sure. Yeah, he was he was he, he was thinking of the way that uh, um, the typical you know moderns and logical positivists etc. think about facts and and that they're not thinking of them as moments of appearing in the Heideggerian sense. They're just thinking of um, uh, atom atom like separated uh, propos- true propositions, which you know because they're dated. You know you you say that you know the this thing happened on this date. It's got a date on it. Now it's an eternal truth. It's it's uh, it's about something that happened in time, but it's uh, once true, always true. You know, it it goes into the eternal storehouse of truth as that proposition. Does that make sense? Yeah, that that's a great uh, description. That's okay, really good. Thanks. Okay. Um, I, I okay. think that we modern. That's how we kind of. Uh, introduce eternity again in our discourse by, by, by using facts and sticking to them. Some, yes, there's definitely uh, schools of philosophy that do that, um, it's fair. Um, and even of, of uh, AI, as you say. <laughs> and, and, and just to make sure that I'm tracking right with, with the way, and I'm sorry, what's the fellow's name that just spoke again? Dan. Dan, it, would that be, uh, and I'm asking uh, you both to comment on this, would that be, Nietzsche's version of trying to grasp and hold when he says that, you know, the way he's, he's framing this and or Heidegger's way, they both seem to say like, you think you're holding something that you're not. Is, is, would that be fair to say Nietzsche framed it that way? When we try to say we hold the truth or we hold knowledge, we're not holding anything? It's, it's more like, I think on the historic, historicist versus eternal dispute. And it's kind of the way it's approached by science, some science sciences these days, at least that's yeah. how, how I see I think, it. I think it's fair, but I think what uh, uh, Jim is asking is, would it be fair to say that that's also something that Nietzsche tries to do from his own historicist perspective, not just Heidegger, to say that... Uh, right. I, I find it less in Nietzsche. Nietzsche has a positivist moment at times too. Um, you know, he, he, he tends to go back and forth on that. Um, but Heidegger is clear, has clearer stronger opinions about it than, than, than Nietzsche, who sometimes goes back and forth with positive phase. Yeah. I just was remembering the commentaries on Nietzsche from Heidegger and, and that was, maybe it was brought in Nietzsche's uh, instances of that thought. Yes. What was used by Heidegger, it 
Okay, yes, I get no, it. you're right. In 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 the, in the initial lectures, he does talk about you know, uh, um, uh, Nietzsche has an emphasis on becoming and 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 becoming as being real and being as being uh, you know, a, a projected behind the world that isn't real, um, something like that. Um, yeah. The I'm just saying that there's a so there's some earlier phases in Nietzsche. I'm thinking of uh, the Nietzsche of human all to human or um, daybreak period, where mm -hmm. he's you know playing around with more positivist ideas, so to speak, um, before the letter. Um, but uh, and he's he's less less focused on that. But by the time you're you know the, the beyond good and evil and later Nietzsche, um, your statement would be correct. He's he's very down on anything which smacks of eternal being by that point. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, I've managed to get through the things I wanted to get through, but I want to give people a chance to throw open questions. We've got through three of six. <clears throat> uh, I, I have two other questions before we, uh, I'm going to throw the floor open uh, throw to any, any question people want, but I just want to mention first that we want to do the whole rest of the book in the next uh, section. And we might also talk about um, before we break, um, what we might want to do next, because uh, if there's any books in, in getting involved, uh, we, we might, might need to look ahead to that. Um, the, uh, so the remaining uh, sections, I think, thank you, okay. Um, uh, in, in and out of the cave, political construction and the production ideas, some of the stuff's gonna get into the political reading of the, of the cave and, uh, and of other aspects of the Republic, um, but uh, also just gonna try to get at this issue of, is. Uh, is there a uh, room for a productionist metaphysics uh, understanding of Plato? Um, but we want to get through th this and sort of general reactions to Rosen at the end of next time. Uh, I am interested in people's first reactions to is this valuable? Is doing this kind of stuff useful um, uh, as, as a break from the uh, from the straight Heidegger or not? Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is what we might want to do next. I have my own thought, which is I would love to do at least the first part of this book, which is the, his, uh, his allegory of the cave, Heidegger himself on the allegory of the cave. Um, so we, you know, get his side of the story, so to speak. Um, the whole second half of this book is a, is, a, is a detailed reading of Plato's dialogue, the Theotetus. And I don't know that we wanna go on to do that as, uh, as longer, we, we might want to. If we do, we might want to break in between and go read the Theotetus itself uh, ourselves before we read, uh, uh, um, before we read Heidegger on it. So there's a, a bunch of possible things. There's, you know, we don't, don't have to do any of these things. We could go somewhere else entirely. But if we wanted to keep going on this uh, Heidegger on Plato stuff, the, uh, the section, the fourth stage of the occurrence of truth and the uh, introduction of the allegory of the cave in the beginning of um, Heidegger on the essence of truth is what I'm thinking of as possible for next time. Uh, well, sorry, not next time. I mean, after, after Rosen. And, and that's that would just be for people to get the book if they don't already have it. Um, well, we could decide what uh, what we might want to do out of it and how fast um, uh, later, right? Um, but uh, if if people think that that's a, a reasonable idea, um, uh, we had talked about some other things too. I mean, introduction to metaphysics might, might be um, more general in some ways, um, but I think that this is closer to the stuff we're directly thinking about. I also just think that this is, to me, one of the periods of high drama in the whole Heideggerian corpus. Um, uh, you know, um, he Heidegger talking about uh, Plato on the essence of truth at, at this juncture and in, 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 in everything he's doing. Um, anyway, uh, that's uh, thoughts about what we might, what we might do next time. But so any, any responses to any of that, plus um, any questions on the reading so far this time. I, I really enjoyed um, what I'm hearing. Obviously, I didn't get to read what we got, yep. but uh, that the, I was sort of intrigued too that um, uh, it, I didn't know that Rose, well, first of all, I'd never heard of Rosen before this. So I, I, that okay. was intriguing. And I didn't know that, um, oh, no, I'm gonna, my, um, Str Leo Strauss was his, one of his mentors. So that was wow. interesting yep. to me. So I was like, hmm, okay. So then I started thinking, well, is, it, is there like a lineage of intellectual thought there? You know, a, a, 
it's it's interesting there, to me there, that there, there is it's, it's it's useful to know there's a there's a kind of um important division um you there's a book that rosen uh wrote called uh ancients and moderns which is sort of his his book on why he's not a right straussian uh, as like some of the others are um but uh it's it's worth uh, it's it's worth reading but um uh he's he's sort of a left straussian he studied with both uh strauss and kojev actually on hegel um those were his uh two of his main men mentors he also studied with Gadamer for a while um but uh and then of course taught for a long time but i think he probably learned the most from strauss and the second most from kojev okay and uh, as far as uh moving forward i'd, I'd like to I'd like to stay along this path that you're suggesting because I still am trying to work out um, my own metaphysics. And I think that this is helping me make decisions between Plato uh, and Aristotle. Um, obviously that the game's not over. I thought it was, but now it's not because we have this. <laughs> I feel like I'm back at, at phase one, but that's okay. <laughs> I'd like to keep going so that maybe by the end of all of this, um, that uh, you'll be confused, right? <laughs> well, no, but I think I'll, have a, I'll feel better about I feel better about some type. Of oh, I, I I I get it. I understand what you're saying, and, and it, it's uh, I I'm uh, endorsed in sentiment. But one of the reasons, <clears throat> pardon me, one of the reasons I wanted to do a little Rosen here. So one wishes for some distance on the Heidegger, so we can understand why it matters and relate it to other things and so forth. Um, but also to kind of take it up to contemporary. I mean, uh, you know, this is someone who is you know active in the last five years. Um, as, these are these are living issues. This is not just you know a century ago ago history, um, and and I think it's useful to occasionally um, make it to the forefront, so to speak, so that yeah. you sort of know that you've there's there's a certain amount you have to have uh, uh, imbibed, read, digested before you're you know fully aware of kind of the, the human philosophical conversation going on, and uh, uh, having fully digested Heidegger is most of the way to that forefront, but having digested at least some of the reactions to Heidegger, I think is necessary to actually be at that forefront. Um, cool. Carlos. Just announcing that I'm gonna have to leave something else okay. to go to, but as far as the choice of book, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll follow your lead. I'm not, okay. not uh, an expert on these subjects and anything I'm exposed to, I'm sure will leave a, 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 okay. a benefit. Does anyone else have any objections or endorsements for this? What is it anyway? Uh, it's called The Essence of Truth. Uh, it's on Plato's Cave Allegory in Theotetus. Um, it's from 1932, I believe. And that's by Heidegger, correct? It's Heidegger, yes. Heidegger on the Essence of Truth. You often, there's another edition that people often have of it, but this is the this is the subject matter. And if you if you want to make sure you got the right thing, look in it, it should have um, the clue to the essence of Aletheia, interpretation of the allegory of the cave in Plato's Apolitea. But right. says it, it, regardless of the addition, it's the same translator? That's a fair question. I don't know the answer. Um, this, well, one by, this one is by it's Ted, the same, Ted, it's the same Ted Slater. Uh, th there's a different version of this he did two years later. Oh, I got you. That, that was translated by Richard Polt and Greg Freed. Uh, but this one's, uh, it's been translated once. Uh, Ted St uh, Sadler, got it, yeah. Sadler, the problem is that there's different publishing editions. There's been several paperbacks and the pagination is different. Yep. So you kind of want to get this latest one, I think the one you were showing is the latest. The Bloom, yeah, this is this is the Bloomsbury edition is what I'm talking about. Yeah, and, and if All you right. buy an old used one at the used bookstore, you might end up with a different pagination is the okay. only uh, yep. difference between them. Yep, very good, very good info. Right, gentlemen, thank you very much and I'll have to leave. Okay. See you next time. Well, you'll you'll publish when we're meeting next time, right? So yeah. Uh, it, oh, it's a fair question, but um, uh, I think it's going to be four weeks because three weeks from now I'm uh, out in LA. So um, I think it's going to be June fifth. All right, tentatively anyway. Yes.
Very well. You'll have the rest of the good weekend. Okay. Bye. And it's just the rest of this book for this time. Ordering yeah, books is for the future. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so, do we, we want to? Um, do people have any wrap up comments or, or other comments, questions on the this three three trap chapters of Rosen? It can't be done in three hours. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I had a bunch while I was reading it. Uh, and sometimes when, you know, people are talking, you're talking, some of those come back to mind. But just like that, well, what else was there? Nothing pops to mind. Okay. Without a cue. It's fair. I mean, if you write some of them down, we can, you know, uh, you know, have a wrap up time sometimes to go through some of them. But uh, if you don't need to, you don't need to. I mean, uh, it, it, exactly as, as useful to you. All right, um, Jim, next time your homework assignment is to have a whole list of questions for the end. <laughs> I, I definitely will. Um, this okay. is just bad, bad, bad planning on my part. And then reading the stupid essay and, and the introductory yes. one and like, oh yes. brother, I could have spent my time. I got, got, could have gotten through two chapters and uh, instead I did that. Yep. Uh, oh, understood. Know. Always read the front matter at the end. Never at the beginning. Yeah. That's, fine. That's the rule of thumb. Okay. Um, all right. If that's it, I'm going to pause the recording and uh, uh, and we'll uh, see you guys next time. The time is going to be, oh, sorry, check out this question. It, it is then June uh, 5th, right? June 5th, That's 1 p.m. Okay. On Sunday, right. June 5th. Yes. Which I'm just realizing is going to be an early morning. That's okay. And then we finish the uh, Rosen book, and uh, do we launch into the? Uh, we don't launch uh, into this book, other book yet. The idea is just that yet, uh, we we, we yet, know what right. this is, so that uh, people want to uh, order it, they can have it in hand. If someone wants to start reading it, they can. But we're not going to be talking about this one next time. We're just going to talk about the balance of this one. All right. Thanks, everyone. It was great con conversation. Thanks for coming.